Eh, mitt namn är er Jan Birkan, jag är er redaktör i Computer World. Jag ska losa det igenom den dagen idag. Vi kommer att vara färdig cirka klockan 12. Så här är er det plenty av uh, tid till att följa med på och og så vill du också ha tid till lunch rätt i efterkant. Idag ska vi snacka om cybersäkerhet och specifikt ska vi snacka en del om tema runt uh, ransomware och trusler i uh, coronans tid och kanske speciellt på säkerhet på hemmakontoret som vi vet det rammer många och väldigt många av det som sitter och ser på nu sitter då också se på fra hemmakontoret deras. Med oss i dag så har vi bland annat Norsist, vi har en pensionerad FBI-direktör som kommer till oss fra USA och vi har säkerhetsexperter med väldigt lång fartstid i branschen. Så man andra ord er det, kan det vara smart att følge gott med idag. vi kommer till att köra korta pauser mellan alla inläggen så det är er nok tid till alltid att gå och hämta sig en kopp kaffe. Ikke trakte en hel kanne, men en i en kopp ska vi klara få till. Eh, som dere åpenbart ser, så sender vi fra vårt toppmoderne studio fra hemmelig adresse et sted i Norden. Vi bruker Webex, det ser dere antageligvis også. Og jeg vil gjerne mindre på at i Webex så kan dere stille spørsmål underveis, når som helst. Enten til mig, jeg står da som Jan Birkeland som en deltager, eller på dette QA-panelet som dere også finner nede til høyre, som jeg mener blir cirka der. Og ikke hvis ikke der, så er det der. Eh, vi er egentlig klare til å sette i gang. Vi kommer til bare smelle i gang i dag. Det blir tett program, eh, og det er like greit å starte med et smell. Første del av denne konferansen vil bli tilgjengelig som en podcast, som jeg absolut kan anbefale. Den finner du overalt der dere ellers finner podcaster. Podcasten kommer ut på fredager, og er en veldig god IT-inngang til helgen. For dere som er, bryr dere litt om IT, så kan det være veldig greit å følge med på denne podcasten. Så da skal jeg få ønske velkommen til digitaliseringspodden. Og dagens første gjest, som er Lars Henrik Gunnarsson, han er administrerende direktør i Norsis. Velkommen til dig. Tack. Og jeg skal også få ønske velkommen til Dag, som er en co-host i digitaliseringspodden. Du er en en halvpart av den. Jo, så er det. Takk for det, Den andre halvparten er, er ikke her i dag, så jeg skal steppe in for den. Det gleder vi oss til. Ja, det, det er litt morsomt med litt endring innimellom. Ja, vi må ha det. Det er det, er det eneste, eneste konstante er endring. Så det er, det er godt. Da, du skal få æren av å åpne ballet og stille de første kritiske spørsmålene til Norsis. Ja, takk for det. Eh, Lars-Henrik eh, fra Norsis. Eh, vi har jo tenkt å snakke litt om det vi alle eh, merker og kjenner på for tiden. Det er altså, vi sitter jo på hjemmekontor. Ja. Og, og jeg tror at veldig mange av, av de som, som uh, hører på og ser på, kjenner seg igjen i at man gjerne sitter på en laptop eller en Mac, ja hjemme, som er jobben sin. Men man gjør, man, altså, det blir litt sånn utviska grenser mellom jobb og privat. Kanskje man sitter og har litt Netflix på, og så har man litt jobb, og, og så videre. Hvordan, hvordan stiller det sig i sånn i sikkerhetsbilde? Ja, her er det mange komplekse problemstillinger som oppstår, helt åpenbart. Det ene er jo det mindset man har når man sitter hjemme og jobber. Kanskje spesielt for de som er vant til å komme til uh, arbetsplatsen hvor det er store fysiske sikkerhetstiltak. Man må gå igenom sluser og det er ikke måte på for att komme in på arbeidsplassen. Og så plutselig sitter man på spisebordet eller på sengekanten og skal jobbe. Og så er det en utfordring å skifte det mindsetet til att tänka ikke bare sikkerhet, men når er man på jobb og når er man privat. Og det er uh, vanskelige grenser, og uh, mange av oss har jo prøvd over det siste året å finne ut av dette her sånn, hvordan, hvordan man skal göra det. Mange arbeidsgivere har ikke noen gode svar, fordi at dette kom veldig brått på. Og selv nå et år etter, så, så er det litt som prøving og feiling for mange arbeidstakere. Men det skaper jo noen nye sikkerhetsutfordringer, der du gikk in genom en sluse på en høysikkerhetsarbeidsplass før, og koblet dig på et høysikkerhetsnettverk. Der kobler du dig nå på din private trådløse ruter. Det er ikke alle som har passord på ruten sin, for eksempel. Bare sånne enkle ting som det. Mm. Så det er et helt nytt uh, ballgame i forhold til hvordan man jobber sikkerhetsmessig. I tillegg er det det du nevner med å jobbe på sin egen private PC, da, eller uh, iPad, eller vad det måtte være. Uh, har man de samme sikkerhetstiltakene der som man har på utstyr man får fra arbeidsgiver? Uh, står dette på til enhver tid? Er det sånn at familien for eksempel bruker PC'en på kvelden, og så jobber du på den på dagtid mm. på den samme? Og tenker man i det hele tatt på noe sikkerhet rundt dette her sånn? Er man logget in på ulike kontor? Husker man å logge sig ut, for eksempel, når arbeidsdagen er over? Så der er det mye å ta tak i som kommer nærmere inn på nå over de neste minuttene. Men er det, altså, når du da tenker sånn, 
Mange gode eksempler her. Har vi endret vanene våre på så kort tid som vi har sittet på hjemmekontoret nå? Kan vi si det? Det er vanskelig å si om vi har endret vanene våre. Noen ting tror jeg blir som vanlige, hvis man kan si det. Altså sånn det var før pandemien. Vi ser jo nå at flere arbeidstaker begynner å komme tilbake til kontoret. Og at hjemmekontor kanskje ikke blir så utbredt som man hadde trodd i begynnelsen av pandemien at det ville bli et sånt varig skifte. Selv om vi ser på den andre siden at noen arbeidsgivere er nå veldig på offensiven. Det utlyser jo til og med stillinger hvor man kan jobbe hvor man vil ifra, altså fra hjemmekontor permanent. Så det er et litt skifte der ute på hva som skjer. Og mange arbeidsgivere også er litt sånn på at de føler seg litt fram hvordan det blir, hva andre bedrifter gjør for eksempel, hva de legger til rette for og har en litt sånn avventende holdning. Så vi er i et skifte, rett og slett, på hvor viktig dette fysiske lokale er. Og jeg tror at hjemmekontoret vil bli mer vanlig etter hvert. Og da vil det tvinge seg frem noen endringer av vaner, også på det sikkerhetsmessige, men det er ikke der enda. Kan jeg hoppe inn og bare lure på, er det slik at hjemmekontoret er uansett mindre sikkert enn det fysiske kontoret? Eller ser vi at vi på en måte kan bevege oss dit hvor det er reelt at man kan sitte på hjemmekontor og være sikker? Jeg tror nok man kan sitte på hjemmekontor og være sikker hvis man har noen bevisste tanker rundt det. Og i utgangspunktet så er jo hjemmekontoret mindre sikkert enn arbeidsplassen, og det gjelder både det fysiske og nettverket og hva det måtte være. Så ja. Men dere som er en aktør innenfor for sikkerhet, og som skal være et nøtteralt organ, får du mye henvendelse fra bedrifter som er bekymret på vegne av sikkerheten for selskapet og de ansatte? Vi er ikke så mye direkte kontakt med bedrifter som er bekymret, det er vi ikke. Men vi er jo med på en del forar. Vi har noe kontakt med bedrifter. Vi holder en del foredrag blant annet for bedrifter som er bekymret, eller bedrifter som er bekymret på vegne av sine kunder igjen. Så det er mye å ta tak i her sånn. Det er en bekymring der ute. Det er det åpenbart. Og det er litt tilbake til den rette sted. Man føler seg litt frem på hvor lista skal ligge, og svarene er ikke der enda. Men vi ser at det er en økt bevissthet, det gjør vi. Altså arbeidsgivere er noe mer bevisst. Og dette har vi sammenheng for eksempel med trusler og trenderapporten vår, som vi kommer tilbake til her etterpå, hvor vi trekker frem noen trusler som man må fokusere på, som man må ha litt mer bevissthet rundt. Og så er jo vårt mantra at hvis man tar tak i de grunnleggende truslene, så bare på det så kan man liksom øke sikkerheten ganske betraktelig da. Jeg synes det var en bra overgang til dette, for dere i Norsis gir ut en årlig rapport som heter Trusler og Trender. Og den siste rapporten som er ute nå, der er det noen hovedpunkter som er litt interessant å titte litt på. Nummer en er dette med løsepengevirus. Hva er det? Løsepengevirus, for å ta det første, er jo den største trusselen vi nå ser mot virksomheter over hele verden, egentlig. Det handler jo om at man får kryptert ofte dataene sine, og så får et krav da man betaler løsepenger for at dataene skal frigjøres. Og det er de sakene vi nå har kjent fra media, blant annet Østre Toten kommune. Så det handler om at det er noen som har kommet inn i systemene på en eller annen måte, og så har de fått noen tilganger der, enten til å hente ut data, eller til å låse og kryptere data. Og ofte så vet vi jo ikke helt hva de gjør inn i disse systemene, men ofte så kommer det til syne da gjennom et løsepengekrav. Og man blir bedt om å betale en sum penger, da gjerne i bitcoin, for å frigjøre dataene sine igjen. Så det er løsepengevirus kort fortalt. Og da tenker jeg at du sa det, altså de har på et eller annet tidspunkt fått dette viruset inn i systemet. Og da er vi tilbake på disse hjemmekontortruslene, at du sitter enten og jobber på Teams over din egen privat iPad, som kanskje er litt usikre av disse tingene. Så det er jo ting kanskje folk skal være litt ekstra bevisst på. Ja, det handler jo om å finne en vei inn i systemet. Ofte så vet vi ikke hva den veien har vært. Det kan være gjennom et verdikjennergrep, som er et av disse andre tusenpunktene vi kommer til her etterpå, at man kommer inn via en underleverandør. Det kan være at man har sittet hjemme på hjemmekontoret på sin private PC og lastet ned et vedlegg. Det kan være så enkelt som at du ikke har logget deg av når du gikk fra jobben på ettermiddagen, og søndagen har tatt over PC-en og spilt noe eller lastet ned noe. 
Og så har du fått noe inn på PC-en, og så har du da logget opp på bedriftens systemer på den samme PC-en, og så laster det virus i seg opp da i bedriftens systemer. Så det er mange måter å komme inn på, og som sagt, ofte så vet vi ikke helt hvordan det skjer, men at man har kommet inn, og det er det som er litt sånn creepy, hvis man kan kalle det det, at man vet ikke helt hvordan det har skjedd, og man vet ikke helt hva de har gjort der, eller hvor lenge de har vært der, så her er det mange aspekter. Men konsekvensene kan være store? De kan være enorme, ja. Det kan det være, og for små bedrifter spesielt, så kan de bli helt satt ut av spill, og rett og slett gå konkurs og få dårlig omdømme. Ikke sånn. Punkt nummer to i rapporten, kontokapering. Ja, kontokapering det er jo at noen rett og slett tar over kontoen din. Ved at de logger seg inn på om det er Facebook, om det er mailen din, om det er jobbkonto, hva som helst, at noen andre enn deg kommer inn på kontoen din. Og det farligste vi ser i den sammenhengen, det er ofte mail, fordi at mail er en sånn masterkonto. Typisk andre brukerkontoer du har, kan du resette, og så får du et nytt passord til mailen din, ikke sant? Så hvis man først har tilgang til mailen din, så kan man også resette alle andre passord du har der ute. Så dette handler om at noen kommer inn på kontoen din, og da er det ofte ett tiltak som har manglet da, og det er dette med to faktor. Verifisering, at i tillegg til passordet ditt, så må du ha en engangskode for eksempel, som du kan få på mobilen din, og at det er en barriere som er så enkel i dag å implementere, men som alle får få benytte seg av. Men dette med da, for det, altså vi tenkte litt på hvilke type mailer man får, sånn som er sannsynlig. Før så var det jo gjerne en prins i Afrika som hadde dødd, og du tok masse penger på konto, og gi meg kontoen ditt, så skal du få over, ikke sant? Men det har blitt litt mer smartere, og også litt annerledes mailer nå. Kan du gi noen eksempler på, liksom, hva typiske sånne trusselmailer man skal liksom opps på? Ja, det kan jeg gjøre, og det vi vet nå er jo at dette er kriminalitet, altså profesjonell kriminalitet vi snakker om her sånn. Så det er ikke lenger noen små bander i Nigeria, eller en hettegjense på gutterommet som utfører hacking eller den type angrep. Så dette er profesjonelle call-senter, eller profesjonelle kundesenter, ofte fordekt som legale virksomheten som sender ut type informasjon, og vi har sett det nå for eksempel med korona, hvor det har kommet mailer som har utgitt seg for å være fra Folkehelseinstituttet for eksempel. Det handler om timebestilling for å få vaksine, det handler om å betale for å få vaksine, og det er typisk for svindlerne å spille på det som skjer i samfunnet, som gjør at du går for eksempel og venter på en pakke fra posten, det er et veldig konkret eksempel som er mye i vinden, dette med postsvindel, og de fleste, i hvert fall nå, går jo på et eller annet tidspunkt og venter på en pakke fra posten, og så får du en mail da, om at her må du betale 10 kroner for et eller annet for at du skal få pakka av dem. Og i en stressende hverdag, for mange som har garden nede, det er jo ikke alle som tenker like mye på sikkerhet som det jeg og vi morsis gjør, for eksempel. Så hvis ikke man har det mindsetet, så er det veldig lett å gå på en sånn svindel. Og så for svindlerne også, så er jo dette store summer totalt sett, ikke sant, 10 kroner for deg, de vil antageligvis bare kimse av det, off, ok, jeg var dum, ikke sant, jeg bryr meg ikke noe mer om det. Men når de får tusenvis av folk som betaler 10 kroner hver seg, så snakker vi økonomi opp i dette. Det er jo god butikk, ja. Vi går videre på punkt nummer tre, og det var det du sier noe om dette med verdikjedeangrep. Ja, verdikjedeangrep, det handler jo om disse lange verdikjedene som har blitt vanlige nå i næringslivet, spesielt med tjenesteutsetting eller outsourcing, som heter på godt norsk, og spesielt til lavkostland. Så det handler om at man setter ut deler av virksomheten sin til andre. Det er jo svært vanlig at man gjør det. Og ofte så har ikke disse små underleverandørene samme grad av sikkerhet som for eksempel et stort konsern har og er helt avhengig av. Og da er det en lettere vei inn. Ofte så er et stort konserns systemer koblet sammen med en underleverandørs systemer. Det kan være så enkelt som for å sende over tegninger, for eksempel skal man bygge skip, så sender man over tegninger internt i sine systemer. Det kan være regnskapssystemer som er koblet sammen, eller andre systemer for å utvekle informasjon. Og så kommer man inn i denne verdikjeden på det laveste nivået, altså hos den tilbyderen som har det laveste nivået av sikkerhet. For eksempel i en liten underleverandør et sted i Asia som ikke er så fokusert på sikkerhet. Og har man en kontokapering da, kommer inn i denne bedriften, får tilgang på innsiden, kan begynne å resette passord, kommer inn i andre typer systemer, hvor de da samhandler med større aktører, så har man en vei inn i det store bildet, og da er det til syvende og sist store globale konsern som kan bli helt satt ut av spill. 
Ja, for det er også litt interessant at det, altså, du sitter på ditt eget, som du nevnte, at du kan gjerne sitte på, på hjemmekommet på sønnens hjemmepult på, på gutterommet, ikke sant? Og sitte og jobbe. Og så har det faktisk påvirkning globalt i forhold til ja. det, det, denne ja. kjeden, da. Mm. Men um, jeg håper å si da, når vi da begynner å litt sånn videre på det globale aspektet, da begynner vi å se litt mer også, også på kultur, ikke sant? Altså hvordan, hva slags sikkerhetskultur har man? Ja. Har man noen klare meninger om hvordan vi i Norge ligger an i forhold til resten av verden? Da? Det vi vet er at sikkerhetskulturen er veldig ulik i ulike deler av verden, og at det henger sammen med på en måte levestandard og nasjonal kultur. Dette har jeg forsket på selv på universitetet, så det er et veldig spennende tema. Og det er jo grunnen til at man har et litt ulikt mindset. Og man kan relatere det til trafikken for eksempel. Man ser en helt annen trafikkultur i mange land, fordi at det er ikke alle land hvor noen slipper inn i trafikken. Det må bare ta plass, ikke sant? Du må ta plass. Og sånn er det også i andre deler av arbeidslivet, også når det gjelder sikkerhet. Så det mindsetet forplanter seg på en måte også inn i dette bildet her sånn. Og det vi vet er jo for eksempel at det er en helt annen kultur for å dele informasjon over middagsbordet hjemme i mange kulturer enn det er i Norge. Vi kan sitte hjemme og si at nei, jeg jobber med et prosjekt som er underlagt sikkerhetsloven, og så har familien forståelse for at ok, da prater vi ikke noe mer om det. Mens i andre kulturer så er det helt naturlig å dele mye mer informasjon fra jobben om hva man jobber med, og så detaljer. Så man har ikke den garden oppe på, på samme måte. Og så har man... Et annet kultur rundt utstyr også. Det er ikke alle land som har iPad'er og PC'er og alle måtte være flytende rundt i mengder hjemme, sånn som vi ofte har i Norge. Mm. I enkelte land så er det jo arbeidsgivers PC, altså gjerne mannen i familien da, som har fått en PC fra arbeidsgiver. Det brukes også som familiens PC på kveldstid, den eneste devicen de har. Og det er grunnen ofte til at de store globale konsernene har en sånn zero trust policy, altså at man man sperrer for alt, det er utgangspunktet. Fordi at man vet at dette skjer i ulike deler av verden, og så virker det rart for oss som er i Norge ofte. Men det, det er grunnen bak det. Mm. Mm. Eh, siste punktet i rapporten, eh, som, eh, som heter svind. Mm. Det er et ganske vitt begrep, da, men ja. hva ligger dere i det punktet i rapporten? Ja, svindel er et veldig stort begrep, og noe av det vi har pratet om her før også kan vi jo relatere til, til svindel. Så svindel er et sånn sekkebegrep egentlig som handler om at ja, du får et tilbud om noe. Det er gjerne noe som bygges på tillit eller på frykt. Det er ofte et tilbud du får hvor du må liksom agere innenfor en viss tidsfrist for å få tilbudet. Og det ser vi på Facebook-kampanjer for eksempel. Nå har vi hatt mange tilfeller hvor mindre bedrifter også blir kopiert på Facebook. Så det legges opp falske profiler. Og ofte så er det falske konkurranser, og så får man beskjed om at man har vunnet en premie, men man må betale 10 kroner for eksempel i porto for å få premien tilsendt. Og det er jo ofte ikke de 10 kroner i porto som synderne er interessert i, men det er jo få kortopplysningene dine. Så du blir jo ledet til en falsk nettside hvor du legger inn kort informasjon, og til synelatene blir belastet 10 kroner. Men da sitter jo svindlerne på kortinformasjonen din. Så svindel er et sånt sekkebegrep, og så får vi litt hjelp når det gjelder svindel. Vi kan relatere det til direktørsvindel, det har også vært mye media i det siste. Og det handler jo om at, at det kommer for eksempel en falsk faktura, en falsk betalingsanmodning inn i bedriften. Og så skal ting skje fort, gjerne at man mister en stor viktig kontrakt hvis ikke det blir betalt umiddelbart og alt dette her. Og her får vi jo hjelp i Norge av, av vår arbeidskultur, hvor vi har en helt annen terskel for å ta opp telefonen til sjefen og spørre om den e-posten var ekte, for eksempel. Er det sånn at du skal ha overført en million euro til det selskapet i Ghana umiddelbart? Eller er det noe rart her sånn? I mange kulturer så vil man jo miste jobben umiddelbart hvis man ringte til sjefen og spørte om en e-post fra sjefen var ekte. Ja. Så her får vi hjelp, ikke sant, av arbeidskulturen vår. Så, ja. Jeg tenker da... Um vi gode eksempler her, men, men finnes, det noe, finnes det noe sted hvor man kan uh, få litt tips og hint på hvordan man skal håndtere disse trusselbildene? Det, det er mange gode sider der ute, og uh, vi har jo vår egen side Nettvett, for eksempel, hvor det er mange gode tips, blant annet til dette med tofaktor, som jeg nevnte her tidligere, hvordan sette opp det. Og så er det sånn at de, de fleste bedrifter har jo en, en leverandør, av IT-tjenester, så det gjelder å ta kontakt med den leverandøren. 
og vi samarbeider ofte med, med hittere driftsleverandører. Nå skal jeg på et webinar blant annet i morgen, nettopp i den setningen, hvor, hvor deres kunder er interessert i hvilke tiltak kan gjøres for å, for å få ned disse trusselbildet. Mm. Hva kan jeg spørre Lupe, har den jevne nordmannen blitt bedre på sikkerhet gjennom korona? Jeg vil si at man har fått et litt mer bevisst forhold til det, for det har vært så mye i media rundt dette her nå, og vi fikk jo vi massiv oppmerksomhet rett før jul rundt koronasvindelproblematikken. Mm -hmm. Og etter det så har vi fått gode tilbakemeldinger på at man har liksom tatt, tatt dette mer på alvor, mm. og at man har garden mer oppe for for eksempel den type problematikk da. Mm. Men det er en utfordring, og teknologisk nivå er jo veldig ulikt også. Sant? Vi som tar middelalderende menn, vi har jo vårt teknologiske nivå, men det er jo folk i helt andre ender av skalaen som knapt kan ja, skrive en mail eller slå på en PC som da skal stilles over for eh, sikkerhetsmessige utfordringer, og det er her vi trenger hjelp av teknologien da. Så det er også viktig at det menneskelige aspektet som vi har pratet litt om nå, det å få opp bevisstheten, henger tett sammen med å få hjelp av teknologien til å løse sikkerhetsutfordringer. Ja, for, for det blir jo kritisk på blant annet eh, si en skole, ja. hvor man i utgangspunktet ikke har en, en sikkerhetssjef eller en mm. sikkerhetsansvarlig, liksom, men som da likevel skal sende iPad eller PC med elevene hjem, mm. og kanskje spesielt da under når det var hjemmeskole. Mm. Så, men, men ser dere at er det en, altså en, en god utvikling der, at teknologien har blitt bedre, at den er kanskje blitt, at man har fått den litt nærmere nå i, i, i korona? Ja, det er en uh, teknologisk kompetanseheving. Mm. Det er det, og vi ser det på ulike nivåer i samfunnet. Så også eldre for eksempel, som kanskje ikke har hatt noe forhold til teknologi, de har jo nå blitt tvunget til å bestille pakker på nettet plutselig, ikke sant? For første gang som man blir stilt overfor på en helt annen måte. Og her har jo vi tett dialog også med andre aktører rundt den problematikken. Og regjeringen har jo også nå et initiativ på dette med den digitale livsreisen, slik at man i alle faser av livet får god hjelp på teknologien, og ikke minst det sikkerhetsmessige da, som vi er opptatt av. Mm. Mm. Jeg ser at vi begynner å nærme oss uh, landing. Uh, ja, for... jeg vil gjerne slippe inn et spørsmål før du skal få avslutte. Ja. Uh, og det er for at det kommer inn mye spørsmål, ja. mens du står på at du, og veldig mange er opptatt av hjemmekontor. Mm. Uh, så jeg har bare valgt ut ett egentlig, og det er uh, hvor lang tid er det naturlig å anta at det tar før hjemmekontoret nærmer seg en on-prem-type sikkerhet. Mm. Altså, med, på, med tanke på at teknologi tas i bruk, brukes riktig, og at dette med human aspect, dette med menneskets adferd, da, mm. eh, er blitt, blitt korrekt ønsket adferd. Mm. Da, ser dere for dere at vi kommer dit? Jeg tror det. Jeg tror det tvinger seg frem. Og så er det veldig forskjellig fra hvilket selskap man jobber i, selvfølgelig, om det er store globale konsern eller små aktører. Men jeg tror det tvinger seg frem sammen med at hjemmekontor vil bli mer vanlig etter hvert. Det vil bli økt bruk av hjemmekontor, helt åpenbart, fordi at det også tar ned reise og presse på kollektivtrafikk og alt dette her sånn. Og ikke minst type webinarer som vi holder nå, mye mer vanlig enn å reise fysisk til konferanser. Slik at det vil komme, men om det kommer om to år eller om fem år, det er vanskelig for meg å svare på, men jeg tror det vil følge utviklingen fremover på bruk av hjemmekontor. Mm. Ja, en ting jeg ønsker vi skal bare tørst innom til slutt. Vi har, du har nevnt jo dette med teknologi, men også dette med menneskelige. Jeg vil ønske at vi skal holde oss litt på det menneskelige. Eh, for en ting som er veldig typisk norsk, eh, og som er en viktig, eh, viktig styrke i samfunnet vårt, det er tillit. Ja. Eh, og hvordan er tillit, eh, hvordan ser dere det i forhold til sikkerhet, hvordan, hvordan skårer vi der? Er det, er, det en, er det en hemsko for oss, eller er det en, fremdeles en, en styrke? Jeg vil si at det er en styrke. Altså, det sies jo ofte at vi nordmenn er naive, ikke sant? Men jeg synes det er å dra det for langt. Vi er ikke det, men vi har en, en grunnleggende god tro til hverandre, og det er en styrke i samfunnet. For det skaper oss en lavere terskel for å ta opp problemstillinger og prate mer åpent sammen på tvers av ulike nivåer, også i bedriften, og hvordan man skal håndtere ting. Så i mange andre kulturer så er det jo mye mer silo, ikke sant, i de ulike nivåene i bedriften, hvor man ikke utveksler informasjon på tvers av nivåene. Så denne tilliten, det er en viktig faktor i det norske samfunnet. Og nå er jo Norge et mekka for kriminelle på mange måter, men Norge er jo også et sted hvor man kan ja, glemme igjen laptopen sin på bussen, og med stor sannsynlighet faktisk få den tilbake på ytterkostkontoret. Så mm. her er det liksom noen positive fordeler ved det hele. Mm. 
Bra. Eh, vi er på tid. Vi er på tid, så nu skal jeg bare få lov til å si tusen takk for at dere kunne komme i dag. Sette veldig pris på det. Det var en kjempebra innledning på dagen. Jeg ser at folk er litt jassa opp i, I kommentarfeltene her allerede, så det er kjempefint. Ja. Eh, og til dere der hjemme, det er bare å henge med i svingene. Eh, vi er tilbake om cirka fire minutter. Da kommer det et innlegg på engelsk, så hvis dere ikke kan engelsk, så har dere fire minutter å lære det på. Så da ses vi klokken halv ti. Hej og velkommen tilbake. Her går det litt fort for, for sig, så nå skal jeg bytte over til engelsk. I'd like to welcome everyone back again. I'd also like to welcome in uh, Peter Grimman. You're the CTO at Veritas. You can hear us and see us, Peter. No, I'm speaking at the moment. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, hear absolutely me we can. Yes, 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 we can. That is brilliant. Excellent. We had some funny voices and it was a bit strange. And I thought, mm, I'm pretty sure Peter doesn't sound like that. But uh, But you're all good now. That's perfect. Very good. Thank you very much for coming in today. Where are you coming to us from? Uh, so I'm in uh, I'm in Twickenham, uh, West London, in the UK. Oh, excellent! Oh, yeah. that's the it's rugby grounds, right? Twickenham. That, that's it. Yes, yes. Best known oh, for the rugby that's... stadium. That's correct. Yeah. Ah, oh, very good, very good. All right, and I understand you're here today to, uh, to share some insights from a study you guys have done on ransomware resiliency. Is that correct? That's it. Yep, yep. Hope to uh, shine a little bit more light on what's happening in the world of ransomware. Excellent. And I, I believe you have a, uh, a presentation with you, so I'm just going to leave it up to you now and uh, we'll have you share your screen when you're ready to do that and take us through the uh, presentation. Super. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you all this morning. Um, uh, as I've as already been said, my name is Peter Grimmond. I'm head of uh, technology for Veritas in our international geo, which is essentially everything outside of the US. Uh, and uh, Veritas, for those of you who don't know us, uh, are a leader in enterprise data management software. Uh, and so I'm going to focus this morning on how you can help to improve your ransomware resiliency posture through improved data management. I'm not an information security specialist. There's going to be other presenters, I'm sure, who can do a better job on that. But I want to tell, take a little bit of time to talk to you about how data management can help in the world of, of ransomware resiliency. I thought I'd start with a story. It's always good to start with a story. Uh, and this is an unfortunate story for a uh, particular uh, clothing retailer in the UK uh, who were attacked by the Conti ransomware gang uh, earlier this year, 10th of January this year. The gang actually infiltrated their environment uh, via a phishing attack, which, as I'm sure you know, is a very common way for ransomware attacks to, to uh, take place. Uh, and having compromised the initial system, they were able to move laterally through uh, the company's uh, network compromising uh, a number of servers along the way. And they, they spent about a week um, finding their way around the network uh, and compromising more and more systems. And it, so it wasn't until the 17th of January that they actually uh, uh, started to, to act. And at that point, they stole uh, 200 gigabytes of data and they started encrypting uh, systems including uh, the company's backup servers, which were based on Windows uh, and therefore were uh, somewhat vulnerable, unfortunately, to, to ransomware. Uh, so the backup servers were taken down. Uh, and at that point, the gang opened up negotiations uh, with the, the retailer, um, uh, demanding an $8 million ransom. And you can see on the right-hand side there, the, the chat session that went on between what they, what they described as their support team uh, and, uh, and the, unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate victim. Um, those negotiations went on for some time. Um, uh, they were able to to find out from the data that they'd stolen that the company had insurance. Uh, they claimed, therefore, the company should be able to pay the ransom because of the insurance. Uh, you can see from the talk track that the company argued that uh, due to the pandemic, uh, a lot of their revenues had, had been reduced and they didn't have the money to pay. Um, as I say, negotiations went on for some time and eventually concluded uh, two or three weeks later with a ransom payment of $2 million, at which point, um, those nice fellows from the Conti gang uh, provided the company with uh, a report on uh, on uh, a security assessment report with advice on how to improve their security posture in future. Uh, and it's a it's a common trend I think now that amongst ransomware attacks that the the gangs kind of pose as security consultants um, and uh, and provide security advice. Um, I think a number of things to note about this attack. The first is that um, uh, it's not uncommon, unfortunately. 
Uh, the second is that there is a, a, a been, there's been a change in the in the mode of the attack, uh, and that's that uh, organisations or gangs are not now just trying to uh, encrypt data and cause chaos, but they're also stealing that data. So they now have two two things over you when they come for a ransom. One is that they can release that data uh, onto their website and share um, your uh, your company information and your customers' information. Uh, and secondly, of course, they've encrypted your systems. A uh, very unfortunate tale, but unfortunately uh, not a not a unique one. Um, uh, some some uh, charts here from various reports showing that ransomware attacks have really increased dramatically over the last couple of years. Uh, certainly fueled to some extent by the pandemic. Uh, so about two and a half times as many ransomware attacks um, this uh, at the end of this last year as there were two years previously. And what we're also seeing is a dramatic increase in the ransom the, the value of the ransom payments and. That's um, an indication of a change of uh, the victim. Um, so these gangs are no, no longer targeting you know, uh, uh, in individuals or small companies. They're going over after larger organizations uh, where they can, they can extract a larger ransom. Um, and also another, another uh, worrying trend is the length of downtime has increased dramatically. Um, so we're now seeing you know, downtime of, of more than 20 days as a result of these attacks. Um, so a big impact on organizations and their ability to continue to do business. Um, and in case you think that this is happening elsewhere in the world and not, not in Norway or not in the Nordics, unfortunately that's not the case. Uh, this is some information from uh, a report of ours um, that we, we commissioned late last year. And you can see that nearly a third of the customers that we interviewed have had a ransomware attack, at least one. Uh, and of those that were attacked, 86% ended up paying at least part of the ransom that had been demanded. Um, why are they paying? Well, they're, they're paying partly because they, they don't want their data exposed and partly because they need to get their data back and get their systems operational. Uh, and in many cases, they, they, they don't have um, you know, sufficient capability to restore that data themselves. Um, so what, why, why, is the, why are ransomware attacks on the increase? Why is, why is, this, um, why is this becoming big business? Um, well, what we've seen over the last uh, couple of years is a, is a rapid increase in uh, digital transformation uh, in uh, many enterprises. Um, you can see again from the study on the left, which is, which is our, from our ransomware resiliency report, that um, um, nearly two thirds of customers in the Nordics uh, now have at least half of their data in public cloud. So a dramatic increase in the adoption of public cloud for storing data, and that's a, um, a, a good indicator of the acceleration of digital transformation. And then on the right, you see a chart that I've taken from a report from Flex Era, uh, indicating that um, you know, from, from the information they got from their customers, uh, that the pandemic has really increased uh, the adoption of cloud and, and digitalization as part of, uh, as, uh, as a result of, of the pandemic. So we are seeing this rapid increase in digital transformation. Uh, and at the same time, it seems that uh, our countermeasures, our resiliency uh, uh, and security measures are not keeping up. Um, so again, from, from our recent report, you can see that uh, nearly 90% of the customers that we surveyed feel that their uh, IT security measures are lagging behind uh, the rate of tra transformation and, and the IT complexity that's being created by that transformation. Um, and this is leading to some real concerns, right? First concern, they really don't feel that they have uh, uh, visibility into the increasing level of data and the distribution of their applications uh, across their public and private clouds. And second concern, you know, very much worried about uh, external attacks, um, you know, security breaches and ransomware being top of the list. So to sum this up, really, you know, we see uh, a growing uh, resiliency gap. Um, you know, the rate of digital transformation is increasing. Uh, resiliency measures are definitely uh, uh, being increased as well, but not at the same rate. And this is leaving a real gap for many organizations. Um, uh, and that gap is, is uh, um, an opportunity for ransomware attacks uh, and as a result for downtime and data loss. So how to deal with this? Well, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with uh, NIST's uh, cybersecurity framework. Um, and you know, obviously following that, implementing the measures uh, that that recommends is a very good way to help. Um, 
Now, we believe that data management can play a big part in that. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm not, not here to, to tell you about uh, cybersecurity measures. That's really not my speciality. But when it comes to data management, we think that there's three areas of the NIST model which are particularly relevant. Uh, firstly, uh, protecting. And so protecting, protecting your data and your workloads. Uh, secondly, detecting changes in your data uh, and your environment, which might indicate that you're under attack. Uh, and then thirdly, um, you know, having an effective recovery mechanism in place. Uh, so when it comes to protection, um, you know, I think it starts really with trying to minimize the data attack surface. So assuring that you have uh, as little data available uh, to be to be stolen or encrypted as as possible, uh, whilst of course having the data you need to conduct your business, uh, securing that data, uh, and making sure you're doing that at scale. Um, you know, the, many of the ransomware attacks that that we hear about, um, you know, are, are attack a lot of systems in the environment. So you've got to be able to protect your data across all of your production workloads, including uh, the supporting infrastructure systems such as Active Directory and so on. Um, when it comes to detection, um, you know, there's a number of things that you can look at. So uh, being able to detect changes changes in users' behaviour. Um, so it could be that if a particular user's account has been compromised, then the activity from that account changes, and you can detect that. Obviously, changes in data. So being able to spot that data is being encrypted or all exfiltrated, um, and then uh, changes in the infrastructure. So detecting when something's something's changed, which could indicate that you're under attack. Um, and then recovery, um, the keys here really are firstly orchestration, being able to recover at scale um, across many tens, hundreds, or even thousands of systems is not something you can do manually. So having the right orchestration tools in place is critical. Having good control over that is, is, is vital. Um, and then that will allow you to, to avoid or at least reduce the, the ransoms you have to pay. So let's dig into those in a little bit more detail. Let's start with protection. Um, and I, I think this really splits into two. So firstly, it's it's about trying to minimize and secure your primary data. Uh, and then it's about assuring that you have a resilient second copy of data that you can use for recovery if you need to. Um, so another recent survey we did um, looked at uh, the nature of the data that our customers have in their environment. Um, and we found that uh, over half of the data that customers have is what we call dark data. And what we mean by that is that customers just don't know what it is. So it's data that's lying around on file stores, um, could be on-premises, could be in the cloud, uh, but they really haven't classified it or tagged it. Uh, and so they don't know what value it has at all. Um, then the second category of data is what we call ROT. So that's redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. Uh, and that's data that they have classified and they know they don't really need it. So it's very old uh, or, or it's multiple copies. Um, or it's, it's trivial stuff, it's, you know, cat photos and the like. Um, and then, then the, the last category is, is the, the business critical data, the data you really need. And uh, in, in, this is data taken from Nordics customers. In the Nordics, only 11% of the data in customers environment is, is business critical. Um, now, of course, it could be that some of that dark data is business critical too, but you don't know. Um, so getting visibility into your dark data is really the first place to start. Uh, understand what data you have understand the value of that data, understand whether it's rot or business critical, uh, and then treat it accordingly. Uh, and if it's rot, either archive it or preferably delete it. Um, and then if it's business critical, make sure you've put the appropriate data governance policies around it uh, and that you've put effective file access controls in place. In many cases, uh, data is lying around on file shares with, with open access permissions. Uh, and that's just, uh, just inviting um, uh, the ransomware gangs to come in and first steal that data and then secondly, encrypt it. So minimizing and securing your primary data is, is a really good first step to reducing your, your data attack surface when it comes to a ransomware attack, uh, and also minimizing the data you have to back up and therefore have to restore in the event that you need to do that. Uh, then the second step really is about assuring you have a resilient second copy. And there's a, there's a well-known principle here, for those of us that work in data management, uh, which was described as the 3 2, one principle. Uh, what does that mean? It means you've got three copies of your data uh, on at least two different types of media, uh, and one of those is off-site somewhere. Um, now, we asked our Nordics customers uh, how many of them are implementing a 3 2, one strategy today, and it was only 8% of our customers were doing that. 
Um, so a lot of opportunity uh, for organizations to improve um, their, the security of their data so they can recover in the event that they're attacked and their data is encrypted. Uh, and we would recommend that you assure, ensure you have an immutable copy of your data. Sometimes that's referred to as a cyber vault, uh, but it's a copy of your data that cannot be tampered with. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, even if you're attacked and even if your backup servers are compromised, the data itself remains secure uh, and you can recover the backup server manually and then start restoring the data again. As part of that, it's, it's, it's worth considering implementing some form of air gap, so some way of assuring that, that if, if one environment is attacked, uh, another environment remains available. Now, the most obvious way of, of doing an air gap would be something like uh, uh, backing up to tape um, or, and taking that media offsite, uh, but often that's not particularly convenient. Uh, and doesn't allow you to recover at scale if you need to. Um, so it may be that you need to look at uh, more sophisticated methods. It's also important to assure your, your backup servers are hardened. Um, so uh, in many of the cases where we see ransomware attacking backup systems, it's because it's running on Windows uh, and that those systems are not properly hardened. So make sure you're running on a, a hardened operating system and that you're running Post intrusion detection system uh, uh, services on on those systems, um, and that you've got proper role based access control around them, uh, so that your backup servers cannot be compromised, uh, or at least the risk of that is absolutely minimised. Second step then detection. How do you detect when an attack's underway? Well, there's obviously plenty of uh, cyber security tools that can help with detecting an attack, but there's also data management tools that can help with that. Um, so, you know, tools that, for example, can can spot um, anomalous file access patterns. Um, so they can trend file access over time on file shares. And then if you see a sudden spike in activity, that could be perfectly harmless, but it could also be malicious. And by feeding that information into your security information management system and correlating that with other data, it can give you a good early warning that you're under attack and you need to take take countermeasures. Similarly, you can scan, right? So scanning for ransomware file signatures, uh, a, a good way of, of, of detecting a, um, a, that an attack's underway. And then when it comes to your secondary data, again, you can take similar measures, right? So uh, looking for anomalous behavior in your backup traffic. So you know, if, you, if you've been backing up a, a server day after day, uh, and you've been backing up you know, 100 gigabytes off that server each day, and then suddenly you find you've backed up a terabyte off that server, um, that would suggest there's been a lot of change on that system, uh, and that could well be because it's been compromised. It might not be, but it could be. So uh, taking a look at that is important. Uh, also, making sure that you're you're scanning your backup data for malware. Um, you know, the scanners now that will allow you to do that, uh, and that will assure that you're not backing up data that's already been compromised, and then and then restoring that later. It's also important to to make sure you're looking for underprotected workloads and applications. Um, you know, I, I, I know in the, the previous session you were talking about outsourcing and how outsourcing can add to the risk, the cyber risk. Um, you know, we've had examples where customers have outsourced their data protection uh, to a third party, uh, and they found later to their cut their cost that that third party has not implemented the policies that they've they've requested. So that three two one principle has not been applied, for example, even though it was stipulated. Uh, and then when it comes to try and do a recovery, it's not possible. So making sure that you're monitoring uh, the, the policies that you've put in place, particularly if you're using an outsourcer for data protection, is a very important step. And then finally, recovery. Um, recovery is obviously the critical point here, right? If you've been compromised, you need to be able to recover. And I think it's important to, to make sure that you've, you've planned for recovery. So having a plan is critical. Be ready to start from ground zero. Right? You may well be in a position where all of your systems have been compromised, including the supporting infrastructure systems. How would you get those back? Make sure you know the priorities of all your IT applications and you know what you're going to recover first. Understand the dependencies between those applications. It may well be that a critical application depends on a less critical one and you, you're not aware of that dependency. And then have a plan to understand how you would identify your last known good copy. Ensure you can recover rapidly at scale. If you've been compromised, it could be tens, hundreds, or thousands of systems you've got to recover very quickly. And so make sure you've sized your backup environment, not for, not for everyday backups, but for re recovery in the event of a major incident. And then consider supplementary technologies like snapshots or continuous data protection 
which will allow you to recover that data more quickly at scale. And then also think about the human issues here. Will you have enough people to do that recovery? So if you can automate the recovery process, that, that could well help with that, because then the people that you have can just press a, you know, a, a logical button and have the recovery done for them. Final step is make sure um, that you're testing regularly. Um, uh, you know, it's really important that you test at scale. Uh, you test for a full, full uh, incident. Uh, that, that you figure out how you're going to identify your last known good copy uh, and that you simulate the loss of, of critical infrastructure services and how you're going to recover those. Um, I know I'm short of time, but just very quickly, a quick case study. Um, so this, uh, this is actually a large service provider, um, global service provider of IT services. They were attacked by ransomware um, just over a year ago. Um, they had all their air internal systems encrypted, including their backup servers, which were, again, Windows based. Um, it caused them broad disruption. Uh, it actually took down their VDI environment, which they just stood up to allow home working. Uh, and their CEO uh, estimated that it cost them between 50 and 70 million um, just in the quarter when the attack happened. Um, subsequent to that attack, they've engaged us. Um, we've helped them implement a new global uh, backup and recovery capability um, using hardened architecture with immutable storage um, so they can be sure that their backups will not be compromised again. And we've deployed analytics tools for them which allow them to detect anomalous behaviors in their, in, in, in their file systems and make sure they're adhering to their backup policies. Uh, and we've also helped them implement automated tools to roll back and recover critical workloads when they have an incident. So just to summarize then, We've seen a huge increase in ransomware attacks over the last couple of years, more than two and a half times. Um, organizations are more vulnerable than they have been because of the digital transformation acceleration that we've seen as a result of COVID-19. Um, and we believe that uh, putting effective data management measures in place to protect your data, to detect if you're under attack, and to recover at scale if you've been attacked can help to close that resiliency gap. Thank you for listening. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very, very interesting. We've had some comments in the uh, in the chat here asking for um, uh, for some sources, and I've, I've shared the white paper report from Veritas on that. Just so you're so just so you're aware of that. Thank you very um, much. We don't have much time, but I wanted to just briefly touch on some things, and I'm not sure if it's part of, but it's interesting when when you mentioned the Conti Gang example. Mm. Um, the the clothing store they they inform customers of the breach after they've negotiated the price and gotten their access to the data back. What is your view or what is Veritas' view on informing customers and the public during an attack like that? Yeah, look, I, I think ultimately you've got to make sure you're complying with um, with the, the uh, regulators in your particular jurisdiction, right? Um, you know, I think most regulators expect you to notify of a breach within a certain period having identified that breach. Um, and and you should but you should uh, comply with that with that regulation. I think it's really important that organisations know uh, that um, that your customers know. On the other hand, um, I guess the challenge is, uh, you know, what do you tell customers if, if you don't know what the what the current situation is? If you're under attack and you don't know the full impact, um, then all you're going to do is to is to cause concern without being able to 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 address that concern. So I can mm -hmm. see it's a dilemma for organisations until they really know yeah. the impact. Um, you know, what do they say? Well, so I wanted to briefly ask you about logging. Uh, we didn't really touch on that in this presentation, but the use of logging tech, tech to sort of verify maybe a safe recovery spot, um, is that something you guys are looking into as well, or is that something you're seeing that companies are doing or not doing? Yeah, look, I think I, I think try, trying to identify that last known good um, uh, copy is, 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 is a very important step, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to identify when the breach occurred, I think is, is critical. So yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, from our tools, um, we, feed, we typically feed data into people's um, you know, SOC, um, so whatever platform that might be, um, and that, that logging, correlating all of that data can help to identify the point at which you, you've been compromised and therefore allow you to identify when your last known good copy was. So yeah, I yeah. think it's a critical step. All right. Excellent. Listen, thank you so much, Peter. It was very interesting. You also have very good enunciation, so it was, which it really, really helps when we're doing this remotely. 
No worries, so I, no worries. I, I it's really been appreciate great to be you with you today. In. Thank you very That's much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to be taking a quick break now uh, for about five minutes, and uh, we'll come back uh, in um, at nine. Sorry, we'll come back at ten o'clock. So again, thank you, Peter, and um, we'll talk soon. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the morning. All right, welcome back. As you may have noticed now, we have a, a small picture of Edwin down in the corner there. Hi, Edwin, how are you? Hey, good morning, Jan. Good morning, it's nice to see you again. We've, uh, we've spoken before and it's, it's, you always have interesting, interesting things to say, so I'm, I'm glad you're here back with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, for, unfortunately, virtual again. So let's make yeah. it real. next time. I will be at the studio with you. Oh, perfect, perfect. I like that. I do prefer the physical aspect of things, so that's uh, that's very good. But it is nice to see you, and you have a good background. We're going to take a uh, presentation up. Uh, I think that you have prepared. Uh, yes. Let me share that one. I have to drag a little bit from the different screens. That looks very good. I think you have it up. Uh, it looks excellent. Perfect. Yeah, everyone can see that one. Okay. Perfect. Just take it away, then I'll, I will leave this up to you. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll come back at, right at the end to uh, test those. Yeah, perfect, Jan. Uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, please post them. Jan will see them and we can pick them up at the end of the part. So um, let me introduce myself for the people who don't know me. I'm Ed van I'm a global technologist. I'm working for Veeam. Uh, I'm part of the office of the CTO and I'm positioned in the product strategy team. Um, if you want to follow me on uh, the socials, uh, I'm on Twitter at Viperian. And I'm also blogging on themeguru.com. So let's talk about how to manage data at a time of disruption. And we also heard Jan from Veritas already about it. Uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in frequency and severity of cyber attacks. Um, but why is that? There's one thing they are after, and that's data. And data is the lifeblood of any organization. And you can think of data as huh, that lifeblood. If you stop the flow of data or contaminate that data, what will happen to your organization? Think about that. A lot of those organizations I've been speaking with and who invited me because they were hit by a ransomware attack, they are instantly paralyzed. And they didn't realize that that they were so far already in being digital. So the data became really critical there. So if you look at data, they have some characteristics. It's, it became critical for every organization, uh, especially if you are moving and doing the digital transformation, and we will see that that's sped up. But it's also sprawling. Um, if you look 10 years ago, it, it was just in your own data center. You could just almost touch it, go to the machines, touch it, that's it. It's now up in the cloud. It, it's a software as a service. So, for instance, Office 365, there are different clouds uh, involved here, and you will see that there's a complete hybrid model being built. And data is moving all over that place, so it's sprawling. But it's also growing at a rapid pace. If you look at it, it's two years. Uh, in uh, every two years, it will double, and it's like a hockey stick. It's going up really, really fast. So that's uh, concerning, but it's also uh, an opportunity for everyone. Looking at COVID, uh, yeah, we, eh, 2020 was a unique year for everyone. Also for me, normally I travel, I will be with Jan in the studio, uh, but it could not be because we're all bound to being at the home office. So I'm in my home office, just finished up with Vimon. Uh, event that we did the last two days, so I'm still geared up for that one. If you look at the COVID, what changed? Uh, what we've seen is two major things. Uh, cloud usage, so cloud and SaaS usage. That's because when the pandemic hit in 2020, early 2020, people were scrambling for resources. You could order a, a, a server from, well, from Asia, from, from China, for instance, but it will not come to you in time because it takes time to produce, to ship and both of those two things in the chain were compromised. You could not get that server into your own data center. So you had to look for resources elsewhere. And that's what every organization did worldwide. So that's why we see an uptake in cloud service growth and size usage acceleration. But we're not the only ones working from home. Also the cyber criminals are working from home because they are mobile. 
they can just pick up a laptop, hook into the internet, and they can target victims. So we have seen an uptake of 70% well, in ransomware, and ransomware being spread. I often get a response from many people, why should I care? I don't have any valuable data. Uh, let's look at that. Because if you move through the digital world, you go onto the internet, you will leave digital traces there. Those digital traces will be picked up. Maybe you will not be hacked, but what I've seen with a colleague, and also I have experienced it myself, is that cyber criminal knows hack websites. And if you log in for a website and order some stuff, for instance, from Amazon or some other online retailer, they can get a hold of credentials there. So they will get your email address. Um, maybe your password was also stored with it. Maybe even some other things that are like a security question they could have, get, get a hold on. And that's where they can create user credentials or they have to use credentials and they farm those. And they will store them in cloud caches. And because of in the cloud caches, they will combine it with, for instance, a post you do on Facebook or Twitter. They combine it until they can create a profile of you. And as soon as they create a profile of you, you become the victim. Or better said, you will be their target. And it will go after personal identifiable information. And that could be driver's licenses, scans of passports, bank invoices. So all those puzzle pieces will come together to a whole complete picture of you. And some of those puzzle pieces they will not have, but they will try to make that whole puzzle complete. Why? Because that data is really valuable. As soon as that data becomes information, it becomes 100 to 1,000 times more valuable. So we did a survey uh, last year with more than 3,000 respondents worldwide. And if you look through the causes of outages, you will see that the first four are server hardware, infrastructure, networking, application server, and storage malfunctioning. But if you look at number five, that's the one that's going up rapidly in that list, that's cybersecurity and the cybersecurity event. So if you look at, huh? in that ransomware and then organizations ask me so not the person itself but the organization asked me why should i care well, if we look at organizations we have two types of organizations in my opinion one that has been hacked and the one that's next in line there's nothing in between anymore the only thing what we can do is make sure that you buy time if you buy time you can make sure that they will look at your neighbor or someone else to target they will always go for the easy target and that's, that's the interesting case in here. Look at how they are targeting. So look for the perspective of a cyber criminal. What we also did in that survey was ask organizations, um, have you have the ability to integrate with your cybersecurity strategy? Globally, 12% answered with, yeah, we have a need for that. And if you look at the specific uh, uh, vertical, like the financial services, and we have more in that, Data, data protection report, it's 70% of financial services that want to align it with the cybersecurity strategy. And a cybersecurity defense strategy is important. But when I get invited in organizations that have been hit, normally I always get a response, yeah, but that's the IT. The IT did something wrong. IT didn't care. IT didn't defend us. But it's not an IT problem. Because if you look at the defense strategy, it's about people, processes, and technology. And often, IT is in the technology space. But what you can do for your whole organization, make sure that you have a cybersecurity defense strategy in place. So look at people, look at their roles. What can they do physically? And normally, in the physical world, people will lock their door, make sure that the house is protected. But in the digital world, somehow people forget things like that, the basic stuff. And then we have processes. So have a business continuity plan. And yes, cybersecurity should be part of that continuity plan, but also technology. And I'm working for Veeam at the number one in EMEA for data protection of data, uh, cloud data management protection. Let me say it like that. Um, we deliver software. So look into the software and what we can deliver from a technology perspective. 
Jan also mentioned it about the NIST. There are five functions, identify, detect, detect, respond, and recover. So if we align them, we will get different features, functions within our software that we can align with those particular functions in the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, it's for all, uh, and the NIST cybersecurity framework is for organizations of all sizes, sectors, and manufacturers or maturities there. So let's look at some of those. Uh, we only have 20 minutes, so I can only cover a few of them. So let's look at immutable storage, the three to one rule already been mentioned, but we expanded that. And also continuous data protection, but also instant recoveries. If we look at instant recoveries from our product, from just our backup file, we can do 91 different restores. So not just putting the whole VM back, or just a file back. We can also do a granular restore of objects, different things, zoom in a little bit on different things like uh, network shares, tapes, clouds, and that sort of thing. Well, we talked about resilience, um, and I see a lot of confusion in the market. People are talking about cyber resilience, but they also talk about business resilience. And if we look at business resilience, it's the ability for an organization to respond to business disruptions and restore business operations in timely fashion and maintain its core sense of purpose. But then we have another thing, that's IT resilience. That's an organization's ability to maintain acceptable service levels through and beyond severe disruptions to its IT systems, the SLAs. And if you look at those two, and you combine that, you get digital resilience. And that's anticipating and responding to challenges ahead, learning from things that have almost gone wrong, and evolving your resilience. And because people and organizations became so reliant on technology, that's why we see digital resilience now. And downtime is inevitable. When your organization experiences downtime, it becomes a snowball rolling down the hill. The problem just pile up, you have lost data, which slows operations, customers become unsatisfied because services slowed and your brand is taking a hit. And as soon as your brand takes a hit, your profits are on the floor. And that's what you want to try to, uh, to solve there. So evolving your digital resilience becomes key in this. Then we get the reality gap. And reality gap is about how fast do you need application to be recovered versus how fast can you recover those applications really? And we asked those respondents and 2,800 of them uh, responded to this question. And what we see is that 80%, so the 34% plus 46%, so strongly agree and agree. They turn into, okay, I think we have a gap there. We cannot recover the applications fast enough as we would like to do that. And if you look at the other one, the, 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 the next one, how much data can you lose after disruption versus how often is your data being backed up? And you see that there's also a gap. You cannot back up fast enough to cover the, the, the gap of people that don't want to lose any data there. And if you look at that thing, it becomes scary because this is shocking. If a disaster strikes, a lot of the organizations, 76% cannot recover their data or get the most of their data back. And that's where we come in with a data availability protection strategy. So a data availability protection strategy is different from a data protection strategy. Availability is about your systems, your services. How can you get them online? How, how are they being exposed to the outside world? And we have two things. We have on the horizontal X, we have RPO. So how much data can you lose? And we have on the vertical one, RTO. How fast can you recover? And if you look at the different uh, policies and backup jobs we do within the product, within backup or application, we have CDP, continuous data protection. Um, you only lose a few seconds because you can set it on two seconds. And you can recover instantly, push off a button and it spins up again. We also have a replication job, but the replication job is based on take snapshot and that takes time. So that's why it's a minute, but you can still recover from it right away, push off a button. And we also have a, a product VDRO built on top of it, Veeam Data the uh, disaster recovery orchestrator that's using those different things. And then on top of that, snapshot only jobs. 
orchestrating with hardware vendors that have the, you have primary storage. And if you integrate in that, we can orchestrate those snapshots. And that's a good thing to protect against the ransomware. It's not a backup, but we can do recovery from those snapshots. And those snapshots often are just read only. So you already have protection against ransomware. And what you could do is do a 24 hour cycle. Every hour you take a snapshot on your storage system, your primary storage system, and we can use that to roll back in time. If ransomware hits, for instance, then we have a backup job. You will see it takes yeah, some hours because you cannot do every five minutes a backup of your whole infrastructure. We have the laws of physics. We cannot do more than that yeah, to push through that thing and the resources we have to do it. And we can do an instant VM recovery. That's why you will see on the RTO, it's a minute. We just spin it up from the backup and it runs in production. And below the cover, you can do a recovery towards your systems. That will take more time because what I already said, laws of physics. A backup copy job. So as soon as the backup job finishes, you can do a backup copy job to make sure that you have the three to one rule in place and you can copy it to another location there. And also on top of that, an archive job. An archive often is on cold storage, maybe on tape, it's out of the system. You have to get it back first. That's why you see hours and it also takes hours to recover. Not because it takes time to spin up, but you have to get the data on location or into some form to restore it. So downtime is inevitable, but slow restore shouldn't be. If you look at the past, we needed 100% backup and we only did three to 5% restores. That was, okay, which, which file should I restore there? I don't know. So make sure that we have 100% backup. If you look nowadays, and also with the uptake of those ransomware hits, you have 100% backup, but you also have a need for 100% restore. And it should be fast, because if you need 100% restore of all the data that doubles every two years, make sure you have a fast restore to get your services back online fast. And it's also colored in green. Why in green? Let me go to the next slide. I can explain that one. So three to one rule, three different copies of data. Two different media, so it could be on tape, could be on disk, could be on object storage. One should be offsite, one offsite copy. But we added two extra things, and one is offline, air gapped or immutable. And the most organizations out there are now um, embracing immutable because you don't have the the the, the 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 need to get the tape out to handle the tape. So all manual labor required to get that tape out of the building correctly you can do it with for instance immutable storage so it stays online but it cannot be altered and then, and the last one but certainly not the least one that's the zero i've been to too many organizations that said yeah we have a backup and then they tried to spin up the backup and there's nothing on there because it did they didn't test that backup so ultra resilient backups Make sure you have those in place. And we uh, introduced in version 11 hardened repository. And hardened repository is an immutable repository. So the first backups you take are already landing on an immutable storage. And if you want to know more about that, we have a compliant hardened restorative guide. This is particularly for compliance officers, but we also have one for IT administrators because there's a different breed there. Uh, and people, um, have a different need for reading. So we split that up in two for compliance officers and VM administrators. So the state of IT and beyond. We did a survey in 2020. And when we asked them, okay, uh, what do you think about where you're going? And you will see 38% uh, physical service within your data center. And they estimated that they would have in 2022 29%. But now let's get the figures from this year's survey. And you will see that already 29% of physical service. So it already dropped to that number that they were expecting in 2022. And now they are anticipating 24%. So you will see that the physical hardware is going down. If you look at virtual machines, it's the same thing there. So we see it already dropping. And if you look at the cloud, there you will see the embrace. So looking at cloud mobility because those workloads are spreading we're building a hybrid environment so if you go to the hypervisor on the left side there on this side we do a backup it comes in a vbk file we send it to a vm repository and then we can just modify it and ship it off and do a restore directly for instance to azure or directly to aws 
But we can also do an agent backup in the VBK file, send it also to the repository, and we could ship it off to uh, on premise or to the cloud and spin up that virtual machine there. So the physical machine became a virtual machine, and we modify that. Why? Because the backup file is agnostic. Everything is in there to make sure that we can recover from that. But also from the cloud to the repository, what we could do, we could ship it to on-prem, but we also could ship it back to another cloud. So that's, that's where you get portability. And if you have portability, then we're talking about data portability and cloud mobility to recover workloads. Why is that important? Freedom of choice. You have an exit strategy, and you can choose the right cloud for the job. What we also see a lot of our uh, partners and customers doing is using it as a migration tooling. I want to move to the cloud most of my huh, workloads, or I want to move to another cloud. Use that as a migration tooling. Why can you do that? Because we have a Veeam Universal license beneath it. And that gives you the flexibility your way. You don't have to change licensing every now and then when you change to another cloud. I put it into a matrix, but I'm not really a matrix guy, so I'm more a picture-oriented guy, so I put it in a picture. And what you can see is you have the Veeam platform, and it will just move to the different locations there. And if you look at our strategy, we build particular services or particular solutions for cloud, for SaaS, applications, virtual, native Veeam solutions. Why do we do native theme solutions? Because we can innovate really fast. But not magic. We integrate it in our modern data protection. So in Veeam background application, everything gets tied together through that VBK file. We can have an insight through Veeam 1 and the DR through Orchestrator. And on top of that, we will see Veeam service providers having a service offering there. So, there we go. And of course, making it secure along the way. Make sure that in the base from the architecture, you have secure design. So to summarize and to wrap it all up, eh, make sure to strengthen your digital resilience through instantly recover. Make sure in any scenario and align it with your RTOs and RPOs, your wishes. Cloud mobility, make sure that you can move around, that you're not locked in and that you can get the right thing for the job, get the right tool there. And of course, make sure that you have ultra resilient backups. Make sure that you can recover and you're not being in limbo or pay the ransom or lose data. That's not, that's not really a good choice to make, to be honest. I've put some additional resources on the slide. You will also get the presentations later on, if I'm correct. Um, one tip though, if you see a QR code, scan it, but also look at the link beneath it or beneath it to the sides on this one and make sure that that aligns. If the QR code goes, goes to some fishy website, please don't. Uh, there's a new white paper update coming. Uh, I'm writing it together with my director, uh, Rick Vanover. Um, it will be soon, it will be launched soon, I think in the next two months. So keep an eye on that space. And I would say, thank you very much. Back to you, Jan. Perfect, thank you so much, Evan. It was, it was as always, very interesting. And it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you, and I'm looking forward to having you physically with me in the uh, studio as well. I will, uh, I think I owe you a beer by now, so, so I think you, uh, need, to, you need to come over. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in, and um, so we'll, we'll run through those quickly. We have a little bit of time, just a couple of minutes. Um, Edwin, do you think companies now are now better prepared for security attacks because of COVID? Um, yes and no. Um... What COVID did and what it showed all of us, we had to rush into, for instance, the cloud. And we have now some technical death. So we didn't do it the right way, we did it now. Um, so we have to trace back and look if everything that's being deployed in the cloud is safe. So that's one thing we have to do. The other thing is people were much more aware because of all the headlines we see that we have to look in cybersecurity. That's also why I'm being invited and like in these kind of talk shows a lot. So it's a daily basis for me now. And that's a good thing. That's also why I like to share my knowledge, not just for the Veeam product, but for the overall and make sure that we can fight off that ransomware and that mm -hmm. the digital pandemic that's been hitting huh, around the globe now. Yeah. And, and to follow up on that a little bit, someone's asking you know, security versus recovery and backup. Is, is there enough focus on the latter? Do people think security it's just defense, that's all I have to worry about. Is there is there enough focus on the recovery and on the backup part? 
I don't think so. Um, I see it move up more into the chain, so more to the front, but I, I still um, being yeah invited into some cases where they did a complete new data center, for instance. They did a whole yeah. new design, and then they came to the end, and I saw they were out of money, but they were lacking backup because they didn't think about it. Yeah, you laugh, but sorry, uh, it's, it's still <laughs> the case. Yeah. It's becoming rarer. And yeah. I, I really like that it's becoming rare, but we have to think about uh, backup. And of course, backup is just an essential foundation. Think yeah. about restores. How can you get your services back? How can you get your data back? And if you have that in place, I don't care how you do it, but make sure that you have those two functions in place. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Listen, again, thank you so much, everyone, for coming in. We really appreciate it. It's, it's very helpful. And I know a lot of people are, there's, there's more questions. And if I get more questions, I'll just send them to you. So, yeah, so please do, and they can also reach me through the social channels, um, and maybe next time eh, we are in a physical location, yes. they can just come up. Absolutely, absolutely, we'll do that. All right, perfect. Thank you again, Edwin. Uh, we will now take a four minute break, and we'll, when we come back, I will finally have a guest in my studio. So I'm really looking forward to that. So that'll be good. So we'll uh, see you after the break, and thanks again, Edwin. Velkommen tilbake. Håper dere er fulle av koffein og sukker. Nå skal vi nei, endelig få besøk i studio. Det finnes jo ikke noe bedre. Jeg sitter jo, det er hyggelig å se alle sammen virtuelt, men det er enda bedre når jeg kan få noen med mig. Så velkommen til deg, Kjell Einar Andersen. Tusen, tusen hjertelig takk. Det er faktisk utrolig deilig. Ja, er det ikke det? Det er ikke bil å kjøre inn til Oslo. Ja, ikke sant. Det var til og med litt trafikk på morgenen i dag, og jeg synes ja. det var helt ok. Det var helt greit. Du kommer från Nutanix och ja. du jobbar med salg mot offentlig sektor ja. som är er, som bör vara väldigt upptatt av allt som har med säkerhet att göra. Absolut. Ja. Och du ska snacka idag om det som vi kallar för zero trust. Ja. Och så ransomware som jag har sett en en som ökning nu under under corona. Ja. Ja. Så jag ska snacka lite om det för det är eh, sam, ett sammanhang mellan zero trust och ransomware och infrastruktur. For det, vi ser jo veldig ofte at det er, kanskje er behandlet i forskjellige avdelinger internt i mm. bedrifter eller kommuner eller offentlig. Mm. Så jeg skal snakke litt om hvordan vi kan få det integrert. Spennende. Da skal vi få opp presentasjonen på skjermen her. Ja. Her er den der. Er det bare for dig å, å klikke deg gjennom? Ja, for meg å klikke gjennom, ja. Jeg husker nesten ikke hvordan du bruker å klikke. Nei, det er litt sånn vei. Dette er <laughs> nytt. Men vi gleder oss. I august så er vi tilbake igjen på veien, håper vi. Men eh, la oss se litt på strategien eh, Preventing Ransomware with Zero Trust. Eh, for eh, vi skal gå igjennom en liten hva jeg ønsker å oppnå. Eh, jeg har et tankekors på, jeg vil se, gå litt om Zero Trust, og så hvordan vi defense, at beskytte oss mot det. Og avslutter med spørsmål. Men eh, bare kort introduksjon. Det er ikke sikkert at alle vet hva Nutanix er. Jeg skal ikke snakke så mye om Nutanix, men Nutanix er en multi-cloud hybrid plattform som er basert på hyperkonvergert infrastruktur. Enkelt og greit, og vi leverer da en plattform for uansett hva du skal kjøre og uansett hvilken sky du skal bruke, så kan vi seamless gå mellom dem. Men eh, objektivt mitt i dag, det jeg ønsker å formidle i dag, det er at hvordan vi kan inkludere infrastruktur i Zero Trust-strategien for å skape visibilitet, få kontroll og øke sikkerheten. Så det er det mitt mål for dagen. Så ta et steg tilbake. Vi ser at vi har eh, silobasert IT, kaller vi det. Altså det er en kompleks infrastruktur. Vi ser i, I bedrifter, i kommuner, at det er forholdsvis komplekse ting. Og så har vi en tradisjonell sikkerhets approach, som veldig ofte er at vi har sikkerhet basert på avdelinger. Altså du har egen sikkerhet, kanskje lagring rundt lagring, du har egen kanskje rundt server, du har kanskje rundt nettverk, du har rundt de forskjellige tingene, og så har vi en sikkerhet som er boltet på på der igjen. Når du får den her, så får du et større risiko, for det, det henger ikke helt sammen. Og hvordan skal vi egentlig endre dette fra et silobasert IT i verden? Og da ser vi dette tankekorset jeg har. Er infrastrukturinnkjøp fra Koblet Zero Trust? Fordi vi sitter jo og svarer eh, på forespørsler i offentlige, eller vi sitter og svarer på kunder i, I private sektor. 
Och detta har jag nu gjort i Netanix i syv år. Det vi får frågespråsmål om, det är terabyter och gigahertzer och IOPSer och kanske nog hypervisor valg eller några hardware funktionalitetskrav eller en eller annen lösning som ska boltas på ett annat sted eller lösningar som väldigt ofta är dedikerat baserat på preferenser till till en kund. Och det är nog fel. Det är nog fel att fråga om detta. Men hvis du frågar om detta, var kommer då se och trust in i bilden? För att eh, vi ser inte någon som säger eh, i en sån förfrågan vad är zero trust? Hur jobbar du med zero trust i, i den lösningen som du levererar? vi ser heller inte vad gör du för att beskydda oss mot ransomware? Vad kan den lösningen du, du jobbar med göra det? Eh, en annan ting som vi heller inte ser Visst, jag blir angrepet. Ransomware. Hur lång tid ska jag ha jag jag kan vara ute? Alltså hur lång tid kan, kan jag bruka på att komma tillbaka igen? Och vi ser exempel i Norge där det tar tre månader för att tinga tillbaka och de flesta bedrifter vill vara färdiga om det finns tre månader. Så vad är strategin när ting sker? Eh, Norske säkerhetsmyndigheter har ju väldigt klara anbefalningar i förhåll till säkerhet, särskilt relaterat till sån segmentering, mikrosegmentering och dessa tingna. Jag jag tror faktiskt inte jag ändå har sett en kunde i en förfrågan, hur den implementerar du Norske säkerhetsmyndigheter sin anbefalning. Eh, they zero attack, alltså vulnerabilities. They zero vulnerabilities. I genomsnitt så tar det 72 timmar från en hull blir uppdagat, säkert skulle bli uppdagat av någon hacker runt i världen till den är utnyttjat. Kan du patcha? Alltså kan du patcha din infrastruktur i den tidsrammen? Vi får inte fråga om det, om det är möjligt att få till. Och det har ju ingenting med gigahertz och såna ting göra. Kan du faktiskt greja dig och patcha? Helhetsliga lösningar eller effektivisering av drift. För detta med effektivisering av drift för det och detta har vi stor förståelse för. Det är extremt krävande att driva en IT-avdelning. Det är hundra ting som ska ske. Det är regulativa ting. Det är ting kommer in, ting kommer från left and right. Hur kan du effektivisera driften din för att så flytta fokus och till att driva med de ting som verkligen är viktiga i förhåll till ransomware och säkerhet? Ta veck basisdrift och automatisera. Det är det vi måste snacka om. Så när jag ser det att i, i en traditionell eh, tankegång så har vi det som vi kallar per perimetersäkerhet. Det funkat för, men det funkar inte längre. Och det, er, det vet vi att det är det som bedrifter och kommuner och offentliga där vet det. Det är inte måten det funkar på längre. Så därför ska vi snacka om det som jag har och jag har tagit det från Forrester Group the seven zero trust extended ecosystem. For zero trust, det kom ju utifrån nätverk. Nätverket skulle vara zero trust. Men vad är det vi egentligen prövar att beskydda? Vi prövar att beskydda data. Det är data vi ska beskydda. Okej, okay. hvis vi ska beskydda datan våres, vad är det vem är det som har tillgång till data? Det är ju människorna människan i i bedriften eh, vi jobbar i har tillgång till data. Då måste ju de vara med i zero trust världen våres när vi bygger det. Eh enheterna vi brukar och det ser vi särskilt nog i det vissa tider när alla sitter på hemmakontor. Hur är vilken enhet har brukar du på hemmakontor? Vilket nätverk brukar du på hemmakontor? Vad är detta med i din zero trust? Nätverket så du ska transportera på må vara med och workloaden som du brukar alltså applikationer du brukar för köra. Alla dessa ska ha tillgång till datan och och vi bygger ju zero trust för att beskydda data för det är datan som har värdet i bedriften vår. Hvis vi nu inkluderar dessa fyra enheter för att beskydda data så så har vi kommit lite av gåre. Men hvis inte vi har synbarhet, alltså visibilitet och möjlighet att analysera vad som faktiskt sker så är det lite vi vet sig då kör vi blinda. Alltså vi ser vi har det fantastiskt men vi ser inte vad som sker. 
Så vi må jo ha den visibiliteten av vad som sker, och så må vi ha analytik som gör att vi kan analysera vad som sker. Og når ting sker, og ting sker, så må vi då inkludera automation så att vi kan ta action och göra orkestrering så att vi kan faktiskt få löst utfordringarna. Kanske utan att vi är er till stede. För det det här sker ju fort att vi må kunna göra ting utan att vi är er till stede. Så hvis vi ser på dessa tingena, dessa syv i den utvidet Zero Trust världen. Hur då gör vi det? Då ser vi på tre ting. Hur kan vi eh prevente, detekte och hvis det sker recover tillbaka lösningen. Och det är er knopp magisk med ransomware i sig själv. Ransomware det är er, det er vanlig standard attack vector som sker. Alltså det er vanlig standard ting som 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 sker i bedriften din. De följer en en process, de som kommer och ska in i bedriften din olagligt. De söker och de gör ting eh och får finna ut var du har hull i systemet. Det är er naturlig multifaktor. Alltså det är er en den er gitt multifaktorautentisering av brukare multifaktorautentisering av infrastruktur brukare och inte bara att du ska som bedrift kunna logga det på med multifaktor och så är er du inne i nätet men hvis du på ditt hemmakontor blir utsatt för en angrepp så kan vi via dig komma in så du ska ha multifaktor i infrastrukturen din och och så är er det dessa day zero vulnerabilities Kan du faktisk patche? Kan du faktisk, hvis det kommer en patch og i løpet av 72 timer, kan du ha den opp å kjøre? Kan du være sikker? Er det processer i bedriften din som faktisk gjør det, uten at det påvirker ned i tid? For det er ikke sånn at, å, nå kommer det en vulnerabilities. Da tar vi klokken 10 på tirsdag, så stenger vi ned, og så oppgraderer vi alt, og så er vi tilbake igjen klokken 12. Det, det, du kan ikke gjøre det. Du må kunna patcha utan att det påverkar drift. Eh, mikrosegmentering, det är er ett et must. Eh, det säger NSM, det är er den mest effektiva måten att beskydda på. Och så har vi det som heter objekt S3-lagring och det ser vi mer och mer tar i bruk. Objektlagring är er immutable. Alltså du har vår, du skriver en gång och kan läsa många gånger. Det är er inte släppbart. Hvis den är er beskyddad med multifaktor och du folk inte kan få tillgång till den, så kan inte du släppa objekten. Och hvis du då har backup tjänster, snapshot, cold data, arkivering på en s så vill du då kunna hantera detta när det sker. Du ska hindra att de får tillgång till datan dina på objekt. I detektering så är er det også viktig när du har gjort mikrosegmentering att du tar steg ett steg vidare och så kör du inspection tools alltså upp till lag 7. Hur du kan integrera för exempel hvis du är er nu mikrosegmentering så integrerar vi med Palo Alto och så kan Palo Alto inspicera på lag 7 så kan du börja se om det faktiskt sker ting vad som sker och du kan inspicera lovlig trafik för hur det Väldigt ofta ett angrepp kommer via lovlig trafik. Ulovlig trafik har vi som regel stoppet, men det är er lovligt. Du har fått lov till att komma den vägen och då sker det ting. Så må du analysera för det till att se att du faktiskt når det sker ting, så må du kunna ha en analys som visar vad er det som sker. Är er det unormal behavior? Är er det ting som som inte skulle ha varit där? Och så kommer det som är er intressant. Hvis du då har en funnit att det är er ting som sker det inspicerar det är er en unormal behavior i i, I nätet så må det triggas och när du har triggar en varning så ska det gå meldinger. och då ska du kunna automatisera eh, detta så för exempel hvis det är er en ett segment en brukare som är er, kompromised, eh, eh, så ska du kunna ta en automatisk action och isolera den brukaren Det ska inte behöva oss gå alarm och alla ska löpa och vad sker och sånt. Isolera den brukaren eller isolera den appen. och eh, så kan du gå in safe och se på om det är er unormalt, om det är er något som sker som är er kritisk eller om det var en false positive eller vad du ska kalla det. Så är er folk i den diskussion väldigt väldigt rädd för men eh, 
Hvis jeg stenger ned noe som egentlig var normalt, så påvirker det businessen. Ok, etter hvert som du lærer av ting som skjer, så vil du se at du blir flinkere og flinkere til å ha ting. Så du kan, du sletter jo ikke, du setter i karantene, og når karantenen går inn, sjekker hva var det, og det var ingenting, ok, så åpner du igjen. Så er du back. Og det kan du gjøre på en ganske kort tid, men hvis du får disse automatiseringen inn i verden din, der du faktisk kan ta action før ting går gærlig. For husk, en ransomware-angrep er ikke noe som skjer over natten. Det er en lang prosess. Så hvis vi ser i Hydro eller andre, så har jo de vært inne i nettet litt lenge. De har vært inne lenge, lenge før selve angrepet. Og det er unormal behager som skjer, unormal kommunikasjon. Og hvis du mikrosegmenterer, så kan jo ikke de gå fra et, hvis de har kommet seg inn i et sted, så er de segmentert vekk fra et annet segment. Og da vil du kunne beskytte deg mye bedre. Så dette er veldig viktig å få til. Og så, når det nå har skjedd at du har blitt tatt ut, du har fått ransomware, da er det liksom hvis du har produksjonsmiljøet, du har blitt kjøpt inn. Hvis du da har kjørt snapshot, og du har kjørt tearing og sånn, inn i en objektløsning. Ok, da kan du kjøre en restore direkte fra snap. Du har alt der, objekt er non-mutable, immutable, sant? Så du kan da gjøre det direkte tilbake igjen. Så hvis du har mikrosegmentering, du har et segment som har blitt compromised, ok, det er ute, vi kan kjøre restore rett fra snap, inn igjen, og du er tilbake. Altså RTO, RPO, rask. Da kan vi snakke om minutter, for å få det tilbake. Så har vi backup, og vi ser mer og mer av backup-leverandørene kjører backup direkte til objekt. Sånn at du, i stedet for å kjøre via andre, så filsystemer og andre, så går de rett på objektlagring, altså S3-lagring. Så har du backup der. Og da er backupen også immutable. Altså du kan ikke slette backupen. Hvis ikke du da kommer deg forbi multifactor og alle andre ting som ikke er på plass. Men da har du en backup som ikke er slettbar. Og igjen, da hvis hele produksjonsmiljøet ditt er tatt ut, så kan du bare kjøre en restore. Og da har du en lengre R2-R2, men du har fortsatt full kontroll over dine data. I tillegg så gir jo objekt den muligheten at du kan kjøre S3 off-site. Og det er mange i Norge, vi har partnere som Move og andre som tilbyr S3-lagring som en tjeneste. Og hvis du da tar S3-lagringen off-site, så har du da visst hele din verden er tatt ut. Både din backup og din produksjon, alt på en eller annen måte har blitt tatt ut, så har du fortsatt en off-site. Og da tilfredsstiller du dette kravet med 3-2-1 backup. Da har du faktisk tre kopier av dataen dine. Du har på to forskjellige lagringstyper, altså vanlig blokkfilagring og objektlagring, og du har en off-site. Da har du fått en hel strategi på hvordan du kan faktisk recover fra ransomware på den måten. Så det som vi ønsker, og vi ser større potensielt muligheter for, det er at inkludere infrastruktur i serosøst strategien din. For da skaper du en bedre synbarhet, du får mer kontroll, og du øker sikkerheten til bedriften din. Det var den jeg skulle snakke om i dag. Ja, kjempebra. Det er veldig interessant. Ja, det er det. Og litt sånn skummelt også, Mekke, innenblom. Det har kommet inn litt spørsmål. Du sa det i begynnelsen når du snakket om dette med Search Trust Ransom, at det er mange som ikke spør om dette i anbud. Og jeg regner med at dere da prøver å være flinke og si at dette må dere også tenke på. Men ser du en endring i det? Er det generelt i befolkningen? Blir man flinkere til å tenke på disse tingene? Jeg skulle gjerne svart ja på det, men jeg har faktisk til gode i mine... Nå har jeg jobbet med IT siden 80-tallet. Jeg har faktisk til gode å se på at det kommer i en infrastruktur forespørsel. For det kommer i en separat forespørsel som er for sikkerhet. Ja, riktig. Så vi ser ikke det kommer i de type infrastruktur forespørsel som vi får. Ser ikke vi. 
Der står det giga hertz og terabyte og ja. grønne og blå bokser, eller hva de skal ha. Litt, og litt, litt på det samme spørsmålet, og også et som har er blitt stilt tidligere i dag, er, altså, er, det en, er det en endring i hvordan man forbereder sig det i, I forskjell på å beskytte sig og det å ha forberedt seg på hva man skal gjøre når man har blitt angrepet? Er det, bør man ha den tankegangen at dette vi må forberede oss på, hva skjer når vi blir angrepet? i stedet for bare for å tenke vi skal beskytte oss, beskytte oss, beskytte oss, beskytte oss selv. Ja. Altså, det, det har jo kommet mer bevissthet rundt det. Mm. Eh, og jeg jobber sammen med en partner, Recoverable, eh, som, nei, Defendable, som, som har workshopper, altså roleplay på å gjøre dette. For det, eh, det interessante er at hvis du blir tatt ut, så det, det, alle blir tatt ut, du, du er ute, mm. du er blitt hacket, så samles en krisestab, så skal du informere alle ansatte, Hvordan informerer du alle ansatte? Ja, du sender en sms. Ok, hvor ligger applikasjonen som sendte sms? Den lå på nettet, eller i, I meg, borte. Hvem, hvem har oversikt over telefonnummeret til alle ansatte hvis du blir utsatt? En så enkel ting, så du kan faktisk informere folk, mm. få dem til å stenge ned, kalle inn de som kreves for å sette krisestab, for å så begynne å gjøre ting. Ja. Det ser vi at fortsatt er det, men har vi en lang vei å gå i, I den. Så, men det, det blir bevisstheten er der, ja. men eh, gjennomføringsevnen er ikke helt der enda. Jeg har også, også spørt flere tidligere i dag, har den bevisstheten økt eh, under corona? Ja, ja, det har den. Så det er mer bevisst. Ja, det er bra. Da kommer noe godt ut av det i hvert fall. Ja. <laughs> vi må prøve å finne de små tingene som, ja, ja. som, som er godt som kommer ut av det. Du, eh, tusen takk for at du kunne komme i dag. Sätter som sagt väldigt pris på kunna ha dig i studio. Ja. Det er pris på att du tog turen in till Oslo. Om det grejt att träffa andra folk än min kone. Ja, det är er lite det är er behagligt. Det är er, det är er, er väldigt fint. Ja, er. Så tusen tack ska du ha. Nu tar vi en kort paus och så är er vi tillbaka igen med en tidigare FBI agent eh, som kommer till oss från USA så det är er bara att hänga med spinnarna här. Sånn, velkommen tilbake fra pausen. Nå skal vi atter en gang bytte til engelsk. Denne gangen fordi vi skal, er så heldige at vi har med oss en gjest helt fra Asheville, som ligger i North Carolina i USA. So I will swap to English now and welcome everyone back. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the uh, Chief Security Officer at Everbridge, Tracy Reinhold. How are you, Tracy? I'm great. Thank you very much and really appreciate you having me here this morning. Oh, I mean, thank you. It's uh, it's early morning for you still. It's it's a little bit out on the day for us. So it's uh, I appreciate you you getting up. You're here to talk about the. Well, we had a little discussion before this, but it, uh, mostly about the digital and physical challenges associated with what we're calling the new reality, what we all now know as the new reality. Is that correct? That is correct. That's absolutely right. Excellent. Well, listen. I'm just going to let you take it away. I will butt in if I have any comments or questions. I'll try and stay as quiet as possible, and uh, if we get any questions in, I will uh, I'll uh, give them to you right at the end. That's perfect. Thank you very much, and once again, thank you, thank you so much for having us this morning. Um, a very dynamic time uh, as we in the security world. So the past year has been challenging to say the least uh, from a security perspective, uh, both from a digital and a physical perspective. So. First, let's talk a little bit about the digital challenges that we face as organizations, both in in attempting to protect our own networks and to protect the customers that we serve. Uh, So so one of the challenges with the dispersed workforce, in the past, it was fairly straightforward. Everybody was at the office. Um, So uh, controlling the network and controlling access was much simpler. Now with a dispersed workforce, we have uh, additional challenges. You know, just last week, I was dealing with a company um, in Asia that was addressing a malware issue uh, and a ransomware issue that was affecting their company, which was incredibly challenging. Um, As I'm sure all of you know, there are three types of ransomware that manifest, and it's actually a commoditized uh, uh, process now. You can actually buy ransomware on the dark web. Uh, That can be installed on computers for companies uh, and individuals. This becomes even more challenging when we have folks that are using VPN and also organizations that allow employees to use their personal devices. Um, 
So the crypto worm, which is a self-replicating ransomware issue uh, that manifests in the computers is a big challenge. Um, and it's also ransomware as a service. As I mentioned earlier, you can actually buy this on the dark web um, and then have it installed. Um, probably the most common is the automated active adversary. These are, this is software that looks for vulnerabilities in your network, um, either through the manifestation of a lack of patching or out of date antivirus software, uh, which unfortunately a lot of companies um, have not kept up with this over the past year. Uh, so we've seen a huge uptick in ransomware activity globally. Um, and it's not just ransomware, it's hacking as well. I know that the Norwegian parliament was hacked uh, not in the too far distant past, um, which was incredibly disruptive. Um, and not to pick on Norwegians because everybody has, you know, the U.S. election, all of these things have seen activity on the cyber front um, that has attempted to impede the ability for fair and free elections. So um, I think it's a global issue that is affecting all of us every single day. But, but I want to talk specifically about if you have employees, if you're a company between 1,000 and 100,000 people, um, and those people are no longer on the, in the office every day, um, what does that mean from a cybersecurity perspective? Um, number one, if, if folks are not VPNing into the system and are using their personal devices, the chances are that a personal device has not received the latest um, antivirus software updates. And it's very difficult as an organization to ensure that people update their personal devices. Um, and, and you can push corporate device uh, 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 clarification or antivirus software from a network perspective. But if people are using their smartphones um, or something like that, then it becomes, a, it becomes problematic. So one of the, the biggest challenges in digital security is the physical element. Uh, in other words, the people. So one of the things that is actually effective is information security training for employees. This is actually way more important than people give credit to. Um, so for example, are you having um, anti-phishing ex uh, exercises throughout the year? Are you sending malicious emails to employees to see if they will click on a link and open a, a, an opportunity for the introduction of malware? Um, what we're finding is that companies that do this have a less likelihood of having a, an issue with cyber than those that don't. Um, the company that I was dealing with last week, uh, unfortunately, and it's, it's a fairly large company, um, and they did not have information security training for their hands-on keyboard employees. So what happened is that the, the, the malicious code was introduced uh, through a phishing expedition um, that was opened by an employee and then infected their computers and the employee was remote. Um, so this creates incredible challenges for an information security team as they begin to adjust to what the new reality looks like. I think that the pandemic has shown that uh, companies and individuals are incredibly resilient, they are adaptive, and they are flexible in the way that they accomplish their jobs. I also think it's safe to say that the environment that we lived in prior to COVID will never quite be the same. Um, the advent of remote work has really uh, upticked. Uh, we have about 50% of the employees that we canvass who would prefer to stay remote post pandemic as the world returns to a more normal cadence. Um, they do not want to go back to the office. They wanna continue working from home. So there's, there's, there's two issues there. Number one is it creates great opportunity for a phenomenal workforce because um, location is no longer a determining factor on employment. Uh, conversely, <clears throat> you also have a challenge associated with protecting your network, protecting your people, and protecting your infrastructure when someone is remote. Um, I don't know that as, as a global business society, we are where we need to be as we transition to this hybrid workforce, this half in the office, half at home all the time. Um, I, I know here in the US, for example, there are a couple of tech firms that are in New York City 
Um, three come to mind. Two of them have determined to close their offices and allow all of their employees to work remote. Um, the third has insisted that all of their employees return to the office um, in, in Midtown Manhattan by, well, by next week, by the beginning of June. So what that does is it creates uh, some angst with employees who don't want to return. Uh, we can't underestimate the security or safety concerns that employees have uh, when they re-enter the workforce. So what ends up happening is that these folks actually leave a company that is requiring something they're not comfortable with and go with another company and they don't have to relocate. So while that is more of an HR issue, it can also become a security issue um, when those employees actually have access to sensitive data or personal information from a company employee or trade secrets that are available to them that they can take with them to their new location. So having that sort of checks and balances process from a cyber perspective and protecting your trade secrets or your keys to the kingdom, if you will, um, is really important as you offboard people from an organization. So from a, that's really kind of a digital overview of the challenges that we face. Um, it's mainly about protecting the infrastructure, protecting the network, and then downstream protecting your customers. If you are like us and you're a SaaS company, um, then you have uh, thousands and thousands of, of company customers globally, and, and you have access to a lot of their data based on the nature of the business. Um, ensuring the safety and sanctity of that data is really important as you move forward. So that's where the collaboration between inter, um, IT professionals in an organization and security and for, as far as information security professionals are critical. They have to work together to make sure that there are no divisions within the company that create an opportunity for risk and vulnerability to grow unbeknownst to either side of the equation. So that collaboration, that, that uh, collaborative spirit is really important as you think about how you're going to protect your infrastructure. You know, it's, it's not an IT issue, it's not a security issue, it's an issue that everybody collectively has to address. Um, I like to say that security is everybody's business um, because of the brand and reputational damage that is done when a company is breached um, can be detrimental to not only the company, but also the confidence that your customers have in your ability to protect their data. So while it's important to have these things in place, it's also very important to have a company-wide position about how you will respond uh, to a cyber event. So the mitigation is one point, but another point is actually how you address your communication strategy, uh, both internally and externally. It's important that the company speaks with one voice relative to the breach and that there's a consistent message um, that will assure customers as well as stockholders or shareholders um, that the situation is being managed by the organization and that you are well aware of it. Um, one of the worst things that companies can do is to sit on a breach in the hopes that they can resolve it before bringing it to someone's attention because the chances are it will become externally known and then someone else will message it for you, which then you cannot control, uh, which is actually detrimental to your brand and reputation. So let's shift for just a few minutes to talk about physical security. Um, so my role at Everbridge is I am the chief security officer. Um, the, our chief information security officer and the information security team, as well as global compliance reports to me. Um, so I sort of have my remit includes both physical and digital. Although I will be honest with you, our CISO is very well versed in the cyber aspects of the world, thank God, because that's not the background that I bring to the table. Um, I am a retired FBI senior executive uh, in the national security arena. Uh, and I bring that to the private sector uh, and my perspective of protecting people. So one of the challenges that we face from a physical security side, uh, much like cyber in the past, uh, we had a physical location that we could protect. We could have visitor management systems, we could have access control. Um, if there was an incident, whether it was an active shooter, whether it was a weather event, whether it was a traffic disruption, 
we knew where that location was and we could actually effectively communicate to our employees about the potential risks that they would face pursuant to a specific issue. So maybe a company had 10 locations as an example. Um, suddenly now they have 3000 locations because each one of their employees is working remote. So this brings up the challenge of a duty of care responsibility or what I like to say is a duty to care um, when it comes to employees. So the employee is remote, but the employee is also spending his or her time working on company business. So, so there's an expectation that you will be able to protect that employee from bad things that happen around an area in which they are located. This is where technology really, really pays for itself. The ability to geofence a specific location of an employee and then overlay risk events um, so that when those two intersect, you have a challenge that has to be addressed from an, from an employer's perspective. Um, like I said before, or easier when it was one physical location, but let's just say, for example, you have um, 10 employees that work in a city outside of where the company's headquarters is, and there is a massive um, terrorism event in that city. By geolocating your employees in that city and then overlaying that risk event, you can actually notify them of that incident so that they don't inadvertently expose themselves to risk or danger. Um, this is really important. The other part of that is how do you communicate with them? Um, so utilizing a system that allows you to automatic, excuse me, automatically uh, notify an employee based on the rules you put into your system expedites the process by which an employee is, is made aware of a dangerous situation and can take active activity to avoid the area or to protect themselves um, at, because the company that they're working for has advised them of this. So what I like to say in the security world is what got us here is not going to get us there, right? So not embracing technology, not understanding the speed in which things happen in today's society, um, actually creates an environment where a company can no longer protect their employees, whether it's from a digital threat or a physical threat. And the speed in which these things manifest is unbelievable. You know, when I, I hate to date myself, but when I started uh, in the professional environment, um, we didn't even have cell phones. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience today that have never lived without a cell phone. Um, so, it seemed like it was a safer time. It wasn't safer. We were just unaware of things that were happening. So if you have uh, data in feeds from 22,000 sources that provide you uh, information relative to threats, it can be overwhelming unless you embrace artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually sift through that. So the aggregation without deconfliction only adds to confusion. So I, I used to run our, the intelligence program for the FBI, and, and what we used to say is the only thing worse than no intelligence is bad intelligence or too much intelligence. So the inability to sift through that, and physically for a human, it's impossible, uh, but by the algorithms that are created, you provide an environment where you're only getting the information that is relevant to you and not to another company. So aggregation of intelligence without deconfliction is not the answer. The answer is having curated intelligence that allows you to take proactive steps, whether on the digital side or the physical side, or sometimes both, um, to create an environment that is safe for your company and safe for your employees. I will tell you that 30% of the companies globally now have the CISO and the CSO or the chief information security officer and the chief security officer reporting up to the same uh, executive level person. That means 70% are still fractured. That gap between physical and digital is where risk lives because you're exposing the company to vulnerabilities by creating an envelope that is not being looked at by either side. So it goes back to what I talked about a minute ago about how corporate IT and information security must work together. In the same light, physical and digital security 
have to work together and ensure that there is a holistic 360 degree protective envelope, not only for the company's infrastructure and networks, but for their people and physical facilities as well. Um, the other part of this that used to be uh, important and is still important as we look at about a 50% return to work is the integration of your facilities management team into the process of digital and physical security. Oftentimes your facility area managers are the first ones that notice an anomaly. So empowering them to actually have an avenue to, to, to report or discuss this type of activity with security professionals actually gets you faster to a resolution point than you would have if you didn't have them in the mix. So, you know, I think I've said this before, and if not, I apologize, I'm going to say it again. Um, security is everybody's business. Um, and as a security professional, the one thing you don't want to be is the king of no. In other words, um, historically, uh, security professionals answer to everything is no, because no means no risk. If you can't do something, then you can't and you know can't bring risk into the organization. Um, as I used to tell uh, one of my one of my deputies, um, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, figure out how to get it done, because security is there to enable the business to be successful, and we do that by creating a safe environment from both the digital and the physical perspective, so that an organization can thrive and be successful, create employment opportunities for individuals, and create an environment that is reflective of the care that a company gives to the employees that make it successful. So I, I will stop there because I, I wanna leave some time for questions. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity. I'm hoping that this has given you something to think about. Um, and, and I will tell you that it's just going to get more complicated um, as we emerge from COVID-19 and as a world, we recreate what normal looks like because it will not be what it was before. I think that is, um, again, the only constant has changed, right? So it's, uh, it's going to be challenging. Listen, I wanted to jump on the, the physical security, but it's, it's very interesting and not very many people are talking about it. And in Norway, I haven't really, we haven't really heard much about that discussion. What is, when, when you guys go out to big companies and you want to talk about the physical security of people working at home office, what is sort of your approach and, and how, how do they take that? Because to me, it, it would be, it would come as a surprise. I would still think I'm going to secure my HQ. That's fine. People work from home. Eh, I can't really do anything about that. So, so what, are, what is the, what are sort of the, the, the questions you get asked and, and the, when you guys approach these companies? Sure. Yeah. So. So the advent of duty of care has changed when it comes to physical security. And a lot of that deals with the expectation of an employee <clears throat> that they will be notified of adverse events um, during the course of their workday. So <clears throat> this is a new area for physical security. And, and be, because we've never really looked at, and I don't mean providing physical security for your home, what I'm talking about is if you are on the clock, if you are working for the company and something bad happens in your area, is the company aware of that? And are they notifying you of that so that you're not at risk? So, and it's very complicated <clears throat> because the first thing you have to do is you have to geolocate all of your employees' residences um, in your system that allows you to determine whether or not there's risk events. Overlaying risk events, which would be weather, uh, crime, terrorism, um, even things as some, simple as electrical outages or power outages uh, that could adversely impact an employee and then providing them with that notification. So, so the way that when I talk to a, a, a potential customer or a CSO of another company it, is I, I, I reference what they used to do in the office and say, now your responsibility expands beyond that. Um, and then with traveling employees, you have the same challenges. So a lot of employees will not have challenge, uh, traveled in the past. So providing them a protective envelope while they travel is something as simple as a notification device 
where they can activate uh, a trigger alarm on their phone that then reports back to their global security operations center during times of travel. The same uh, application and process can be applied at a home office um, so that the office is aware that there is a challenge for that employee in that environment. Um, it is a two-way street. A lot of these are housed on mobile devices. So it's technology and trust. The employee has to trust that the employer will not misuse the technology. Otherwise, they won't use it on their personal device. Um, an employee has an obligation or an employer has an obligation to be respectful of the privacy of a, of a single employee, but at the same time balance that with the protection that is required for that employee to be safe and to continue working and be productive uh, for the organization with which he or she works. Excellent. Also, I just wanted to touch on it because you, you briefly mentioned that you are you're spending a lot more time educating users, talking to you know, people working in the business. Are, are workers now more aware of threats? And in and, and the same way, have you guys sort of pivoted to doing more information work, more education work? So I think that is the crux of the issue. And that what I mean by that is that companies that do not invest in security training for employees, and it doesn't have to be, it can't be a click-through training. In other words, you, you can't turn your computer on, let it run its course, and then turn it off and get credit for it. It has to be an interactive uh, exercise with employees because that's the biggest risk that we face is the uneducated employee. The person who, I'll give you an example. If, if you are a, um, an entry-level data processor for a company and you get a personal email uh, from the CEO, but it's a 2 million person company and they reference you by name and you've never met them, you have no interaction with that, um, the chances are that's probably not right. So something as simple as clicking on um, the, the email address to show what that comes, does it come back with a company email or does it come back with a Gmail or a Yahoo, uh, which would tell you don't click on that because it's actually spam and it's something that you don't want to introduce into your company. So what we do is that we provide um, hours of training for our employees um, in a digital environment that educates them about the risks associated with not only company devices, but their personal devices as well, because it's important to realize that people are going to be answering work email on personal devices. So educating them about the risks, about the introduction of malware is really important. And reinforcing that every, every quarter is important because you, your, your employee base changes. People come and people go. So new employees come on. So you have an obligation to make sure that that training is relevant and it's also engaging. Otherwise, it won't make any impact on them. So education, in my opinion, is key. And a little bit in the same vein as that, and this is going to be my last question. We don't have that much time left, but I'm just I'm curious. Do do your customers sort of lean on you to provide security without much thought, or have you seen companies also going through a process now of giving security more thought? Is there are they more knowledgeable now than they were a year ago? So so two things. The, the, the real answer to that is it lies with your chief security officer, and that is changing the dynamic. Making changing security from a cost center to a value center. And the way that that's done is by providing value that resonates with the key mission of the organization. In other words, if you're if you are a security professional and you want to protect your your, your building, just we'll go back a bit. You there's two ways to do that. You can hire a slew of physical guards, or you can use technology and automation to limit access to the to the building. Uh, and then by creating that safer environment, you create more opportunities for the company to be successful, to generate revenue, and to have a return for their investors. So the, the key is that educating security professionals about what they do and how they articulate their mission so that it resonates with the revenue generators of a company. Because as I said before, security's job is to enable a company to be successful. Part of that is speaking the language of the company. 
understanding the core mission of the company, and then making sure that your security posture reflects the core values and the culture of the company. In that way, you really start to change the dynamic about what's, how security is viewed and why it's important for an organization. That is excellent. Thank you so much, Tracy. These were good answers to semi-okay questions, I think. But, um, and it was really, really interesting. I, it was very enjoyable hearing about the physical aspect as well. Like I said, we, we don't really dive into that that often, but it is something to absolutely keep in mind. So thank you so much for joining us today. We uh, really appreciate you getting up in the morning earlier than we have to, which is very nice. Appreciate that. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Excellent. Now we will switch over to Norsk. Um, we take a few minutes minute pause and then we will be back again at uh, half twelve. So we will see you Da skal jeg få ønske velkommen tilbake igjen til den siste sesjonen for i dag. Vi skal ha med oss, han dukker snart opp på deres skjermer også der hjemme. Eh, han heter Antti Pietarinen, eh, kommer som dere helt sikkert kan gjette fra Finland. Eh, og når man snakker om Finland og sikkerhet, så er F-Secure kanskje det mest naturlige stedet å, å dra til. Um, Antti, I have you up on uh, screen. I can see you and you can hear me, I hope. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Oh, excellent. And I can also hear you very well. So that that, that is brilliant. Yeah, my, can you see my screen as well? Yes, I can see your um, presentation. So that is brilliant. I'll just, I'll, I'm just going to leave this up to you. So you're feel free to go through the presentation. If there are any questions, I'll just pop in right at the end. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you for having me and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, a short introduction to myself and the agenda. So, my name is Antti Pietarinen and I work as a senior product owner in FSQ. Uh, my focus area in FC is FSQ Element Cybersecurity Platform and Endpoint Detection and Response component in there. And in my presentation, I'll have a quick introduction to F-Secure, then have a look on uh, threat landscape and finally see how cybersecurity platform simplifies work of IT and security specialists. So uh, F-Secure uh, is the largest European single source cybersecurity services and detection and response solutions provided for companies and leading provider for consumer security software through telecoms operators. We have about 1,700 employees globally in 29 locations. And f revenue comes from consumers, consu corporate, pro corporate products and, and consulting services. And this is how a normal day looks like in our technical defense unit. So technical defense unit focuses on creating and developing defensive mechanisms and preventive measures that address current and near future security problems. FCQ system average of 7 billion online queries, 6 billion behavioral events and millions of suspicious URL and malware samples daily basis. The constant flood of information makes sure that FCQ elements is ready to take on the latest threats today and tomorrow. And what are the trends impacting threat landscape? So many of us, like discussed earlier today, quite a bit work from co do not work from corporate offices. And just for FSECURE, this means that uh, we have 1700 locations instead of just 29. And maybe the cha change is not as big as that, but there are research from Pondemon Institute that find that 58% of employees work remotely due to COVID-19. And remote working continues and many workers will be working remotely permanently. And like an <laughs> kind of a a refreshment so the digital transformation also affects threat landscape like discussed earlier today so 
pandemic has accelerated many existing trends. So we can see short term ramp up of, of tech spend to COVID-19. But companies also are speeding up with pre-COVID plans. So global shift to remote working existed before COVID, rapidly involving virtual ways of collaboration, increased journey to cloud, accelerated adoption of emerging technologies, and last but not least, explos explosion of dispersed security tools in the market have made IT and cybersecurity landscape more complex than ever. And as we add new digital tools and new ways of working, we simultaneously introduce new vulnerabilities and loopholes for attackers to exploit. Then who are the attackers and where they are? So cybercrime is a business that is global and it's truly a business. The, the new trends are utilized quickly and the human is the vulnerability cybercriminals are targeting the most. The most common actions are phishing and uh, theft of, of credentials. So for example, Verizon data breach investigations reports from this year shows that 37% of breaches include pattern of social engineering. And it's good to understand how cloud transformations also triggers new types of attack techniques. And here's an example of one. So SMS spoofing attack to steal your credential is one of such. And people are, as people are more aware of email related threats today, but there are other vectors utilizing personal messaging habits. As a part of security practices, we see multi-factor authentication increasing, and this is excellent news. But it opens a new route to apply known attack techniques in a bit different environment. People expect to get SMS messages related to multi-factor authentication from, for example, Microsoft, and they have previous history with those or, or companies in their smartphones. And when a malicious message comes with spoofed sender, it ends up ends up to known message thread with a high credibility. So it's good to this is a good example how techniques evolve and how important role people have in ensuring, ensuring security. Then uh, taking a deeper look on dynamics of the threat landscape. Here we have different actors, attack types and techniques. So starting from the top, uh, attacks carried out by nation states, states are the most advanced. They have a huge damage potential they require a lot of human investment, but volume is more on those. And these are nearly impossible and extremely expensive to address. But then coming down to attacks carried out by organized crime groups, this can be split into targeted attacks that are well planned, conducted by humans, and using advanced threats where file, file scripts and system tools are being used. And, and a growing skill set, skill set of attackers, prevalence of non-malware attacks and increasing automation forces companies to adopt advanced security measures. And there on the bottom, we have mass attacks. With these opportunist, opportunistic attacks, technology drives the scale. These are still priority items for companies due to high volumes and the impact to day to day operations and must be handled as efficiently as early as possible. As state actors are probably not targeting small businesses in Northern Europe, like, like in Norway or Finland, but there are still they are still a big part of the threat landscape because advanced tools from these players do get stolen or otherwise exposed. Probably the most known example of this is a WannaCry ransomware epidem epidemic in 2017. And shortly what happened then was that the cybercrime group called uh, the Shadow Brokers 
got their hands on advanced cyber attack tools suspected to be stolen from nation state player. And a few months later, there was a well-organized and automated attack utilizing these advanced tools. When this happened, fixes to vulnerabilities used by WannaCry were quickly available, but did not prevent the epidemic because millions of devices were not patched immediately. And still today, research shows that uh, there are tooling out there actively searching and attacking against devices with these vulnerabilities that were exploited by WannaCry already four years ago. But this shows that advanced threats become commodity, commodity over time. Then what motivates cyber criminals? And the answer, answer for that is very clear, it's money. A recent study showed that 90% of the uh, breaches are final, financially motivated and 80% involve organized crime. And organized crime here means that uh, these attackers are systematic and are following processes and pro procedures. So they are, they are organized to carry out this these criminal activity. And also, like mentioned earlier, amount of ransomware is incre increasing. So data breach inv investigations reports from Verizon show that 10% of all breaches now involve ransomware. And the year before, the same figure was five. So these are clearly duplicating over over single year. And as attackers are developing more and more advanced attack methods, rank, ramping up their efficiency and effectiveness, most of the attacks are opportunistic, meaning they are looking for easy prey. Regardless of your company size or industry sector, if you have data or information worth protecting, that makes you attractive target to cyber criminals. And this headline summarizes that well, that ransomware, for example, is becoming a business model. It's like eBay. You can, if you don't have some resource, you can buy them from other actors. And real life examples are endless and come in many shapes and sizes. Ransomware has been in headlines recently, but on the other hand, that's only 10% of breaches that include ransomware. And ransomware is different from the rest of the attack types. As with ransomware, attackers announce their presence and intentions to victim organizations. But typically, this is not the case. Typically, attackers want to stay undetected as long as possible. And with systematic processes, advanced techniques and automation tools that exploit known vulnerabilities, it typically takes only minutes from the first event against a target device or attacker to break in. And when this red line here is crossed, a totally reverse behavior takes place. It's very rare that breaches, breaches detected in minutes or hours or even days. Majority of breaches takes months to detect. And it takes on average 280 days to detect and contain a breach. If we, if we split this a bit, so it means that detection time on average is 207 days and containing takes 73 days. And like Peter mentioned earlier in the context of Conti case, so impact to the business is a big factor. It's the biggest financial impact of the breach comes from lost businesses. So when the systems are down, there is no business and that remains and is the biggest cost impact that businesses are facing with these attacks. So what kind of challenges are businesses then dealing with? This is what we see with many of our customers. So lack of visibility into IT environment and what is going on there. So there is no detection skills or capabilities. No visibility into remote workforce devices. Or if there is, the data is all over the place. 
there is no situational awareness, no knowledge of assets and, and the full environment. Then complexity. So there, there's a technical mess and very fragmented set of cybersecurity tools. Technology stacks are also fragmented. It's very time consuming to have support processes with multiple vendors and complex IT eats up the resources. And here are interesting figures from Ponemon cost of data breach report from last year says that biggest single factor that increases total cost of breach is actually complex security systems. And the second biggest factor are ongoing cloud migrations. So if the if you have ongoing ongoing cloud migrations and you have a breach that will increase your total cost of breach on average quite a bit. And third one there is a lack of cybersecurity experts. And these three factors increase the cost of breach by 21%. And by the same Ponemon study in Scandinavia, the average cost of breach was 2.5 million US dollars. So these are big numbers. The third one is uh, in inefficiency and rigidness of operations and, and processes. It's costly and ris risky to adapt new systems and tools. The processes are inefficient and all this leads to massive workload for IT organizations. And of course, the, the last one there is the, the, the biggest one, biggest concern that security measures are not keeping up with ever evolving threat landscape. They are slow and inaccurate response. Vulnerabilities are out of control and techno technologies are improperly used. And in practice and on architectural level, this is what a typical security tool stack of a medium sized company looks like. There's a lot of specialized pointer solutions from various different vendors. And this kind of setup is stiff and if, and if inefficient to manage, admins need to jump from management portal to another. Alert fatigue is real and managing multiple separate workflows is complex, making prioritization a challenge. And the management is not the only inefficiency here. Solutions are set up, solutions set up like this do not cooperate and can be completely oblivious of one another. This means silos, missed detections, low responses, and eventually weaker security posture. So how not to fall into trap illustrated in the previous slide. So, so solution is, sounds simple, integrate all core security components into one. And that's what we are doing in AppSecure. So AppSecure Elements combines vulnerability management, endpoint protection, Microsoft Office 365 protection and endpoint detection and response capabilities into one unified modular cybersecurity platform. FSQL Elements is fully cloud native solution deployed in a single agent and managed, managed through a single console called FSQL Elements Security Center. And what kind of benefits this kind of architecture brings to you? So risk mitigation through improved security posture, no loopholes or informational silos. Real-time data flow between solutions enables faster detection on stealthy threats. Streamlined and high, highly automated operations ensure efficient prioritization workflows and faster responses to real, real threats. And comprehensive situational awareness and meaningful visibility across assets, configurations, vulnerabilities, threats and events. So let's take a look how this works in real life. With the FSECO Elements Security Center, IT admins 
has full visibility into business security posture. With a single glance, users can see if there are any issues that require their attention in all protection layers. When a user, for example, gets a notification about endpoint detection response, incident and, and comes into the, this uh, management portal, with a single click, they can get a full layered visibility. This includes status of endpoint, including malware up, database updates, amount of devices missing critical security related software updates, most targeted email accounts, vulnerability, overview based on environment scans, and a lot more. This will enable situ situational awareness that is crucial to understand risks and impacts of the incident to the full environment. At this point, incident can still be stopped from turning into a da data breach. And automation helps as well. For example, risk-based Device isolation will combine first signs of a breach into containment of the attack in seconds or minutes instead of going through full cycle of 280 days. But modern cybersecurity platform is not just about cool technology. It includes service components like element elevate to F-Secure to get instant answer to tough cases from FSecure's own SOC team operating 24-7. It includes flexible pricing models like usage-based security that will adapt to your needs, making sure that you don't pay for services that you are not using. And all this is provided to you through best local partners. So, and what are the benefits of, of these new uh, integrated architectures. So first benefit comes from management and, and administ administration perspective. So you have a proactive continuous defense, high automation, minimal maintenance tasks and automated patching, for example. And there are benefits also from feasibility and threat hunting perspective instant and sharp detections, integrated vulnerability and behavioral threat analysis, and clear and simplified visualizations. And also operational efficiency perspective, you get streamlined workflows, smart prioritization, unified cloud architecture, shared data sets with all telemetry and plug and play deployment. And you can learn for, more from, from our, our website. And please make sure that you have the best protection tested by independent third parties. And, and that's what, what we, we always enforce. So endpoint protection, vulnerability management and latest EDR capabilities are Proven with the third party studies. All right. And now I think my time's running out. So if we go to questions and answers. Yes, th thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. So almost a little bit scary as well, which is uh, especially the overtaking, uh, taking over 200 days to, you know, the tech threats. That's, um, is almost incredible to think about. Um, there some questions have come in, and um, someone has mentioned the, the Shadow Brokers case, which is very interesting. Um, for those of you out here who haven't heard about it, please read up on it. It's a very, very exciting case to read up on. Can you talk about advanced tools becoming a commodity over time? Uh, are you seeing growth in advanced tools being used in, in mass attacks? Yes, that's that is what we are seeing. So, um, <clears throat> of course, like the what Tracy also mentioned there, that uh, what we need is a artificial artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to to really process and 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 uh, manage this flood of information. But 
those are also becoming tool set of the attackers. So they are mm -hmm. using similar techniques and they are automating um, their techniques and, and really in an opportunistic manner shooting in all directions. And whenever there is a hit, then they move into a, a reaction model that, that fits that case. So, so that is a quite typical scenario that we are seeing. Yeah. Um, also, there's another uh, question that came in, which was asking, are, are you seeing more and more a combination of malicious attacks uh, meant to, you know, just be malicious and, and disruptive and combining that with ransomware? Uh, like like I, I, I mentioned that the biggest motivation here is, is to make money. Mm. So uh, whatever serves that purpose. So ransomware is of course one, one of these, but uh, the other one is that uh, the, these players are, are really also collecting information and the purpose of that information collection is to sell it and yeah. or blackmail with that information. So there are two, two, these, two different uh, ways to make money by collecting information so, um, and these, these are what we are seeing. Yeah. Also in, in the beginning there, you had uh, the threat landscape, the, uh, the pyramid that where you had uh, up top, you had state actors and targeted attacks, advanced threats and mass attacks. Obviously as, as mass attacks is where you've seen the biggest rise or the, sort of the biggest increase. Well, the increase happens in, in, in all categories, of course, what, like what we have seen that also these nation state, uh, level attacks are, are getting more popular but what drives these uh, mass attacks is, is really a technology so as today these these tools are advanced and you can use them in a really automated manner and and that makes the mass attacks really a something that can be even fully automated yeah. It doesn't need to have a, a person behind the keyboard to carry out, the, especially the first phase of the attack. Yeah. So, so as security gets better and better, it also gets easier and easier to perform these attacks. Yes. And of course, it's more and more important to, to have a full layered protection in place so that you know your vulnerabilities, you patch them, you have the endpoint protection in place, and then whenever something gets, gets through, there, there are detection and response mechanisms automated. And, and then with enough tooling to, to administrators then to address these uh, damages what were done. And yeah. it's really crucial to, to get out of this almost 300 day, day cycle where the breaches are being um, managed. Yeah. Of course, very good points. Antti, thank you so much for uh, taking time off to, uh, to speak to us today. It's, it is very interesting. It is a little bit scary, and it is good to know that uh, companies like F-Secure are obviously staying on top of these things and, um, and working on us. We appreciate that. Perfect. Thank All you right. for having, um, having... We will let you. We will let you go, and uh, I will switch over to Norwegian now So uh, to, to finish off the day. Uh, Till alle dere som sitter og ser på nå, tusen takk for at dere var med i dag. Eh, hele denne seansen har det blitt gjort et opptak av, og dere vil få beskjed så snart det er klart. Da vil dere få en lenke hvor dere kan eh, både se og laste ned hele denne konferansen på nytt. Eh, der kan dere selvfølgelig da også pause innimellom hvis det er noen spesielle slides dere er ute etter. Eh, jeg vil også nevne at det kan være verdt å følge Computer World Norge på blant annet LinkedIn, og også følge oss i andre kanaler. Det er litt med tanke på de eventene vi har. Vi, der vil dere se at vi har mange eventer. Eh, bare i juni så skal vi ha eventer rundt IOT, datacenter, eh, business to business e-handel. Så hvis det er noe av det som er interessant ut, så er det bare å melde seg på. Som vanlig, det er gratis å melde seg på våre konferanser. Det var egentlig alt fra oss i dag. Jeg sa vi skulle være ferdige til 12, og det klarte vi akkurat, eller det vil si med et minutt igjen, så dere skal få fri det siste minuttet før dere hiver dere over lunsjen. Da ønsker det bare for meg å si tusen takk for at dere følte med i dag, og takk for meg.